All right, folks, it's um, 6.02. I have four LAE members. I expect um, the other two will join shortly. So um, I am going to go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, just as we typically start meetings, if you could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so um, just before we jump in, I um, uh, just would like to uh, remind everyone that we are holding this meeting um, uh, via virtual technology. All board members and staff participating are doing so remotely. We are streaming this uh, in real time through Facebook Live. I will say just for um, the board and the public, um, I anticipate that this will be our last virtual meeting. Obviously, we have to wait to see the governor's uh, renewed guidance because the state of emergency expires later this month, I think next week. Uh, there are some um, uh, legislative, uh, I think matters pertaining to things like, um, you know, meetings and uh, things like that. And sorry, it's streamed on YouTube, not Facebook, thank you. Um, so, but I do expect this will be our last um, remote meeting and, and, you know, we'll continue to liaise with uh, the city council to be, 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 you know, I mean, make sure I understand their plans, but my goal is uh, I would like to get back to in-person meetings. Typically we don't have a meeting in July, but do in August. And, you know, it's my intention uh, to uh, have that back in person. So I'll give, we'll give updates to the public, obviously, once the uh, state of emergency is lifted and, and any new guidance that, that we get on that. Um, before we jump in uh, to the agenda, I'm excited we have a lot uh, to cover. Um, just before we do, though, I want to take a second uh, and acknowledge Joan Malone, who uh, has uh, served uh, this board for the entirety of his existence, uh, supporting us in at anything and everything that we've needed uh, in terms of helping to keep us organized uh, and just, you know, keeping us on track. And uh, Joan let us know several months ago uh, that uh, she would be uh, moving on from this role of, of Secretary of the LAE at the end of the school year. And that seemed like a long time ago when she let us know. Uh, and it is now uh, the last meeting of the school year. So this is the last meeting where, where Joan will be um, serving in this role. And just wanted to take a second before we start to thank you, Joan, for everything you've done. I mean, you've literally been there since the beginning uh, of this board uh, to help us get started. Uh, you've gone on this journey with us that, uh, you know, was new to all of us. And so uh, just really want to thank you publicly for everything that you've done. Uh, and just glad that you're, you know, still with the district and will continue to do work uh, with the district. But just really want to thank you and uh, just say how much I appreciate everything you've done for, for us. As, as the board. Thank you. And sure. I'm actually getting a little emotional and I'm sorry, but um, I appreciate your words, and um, um, I've enjoyed working with you as well. You're a nice group of people, so thank you. Thanks, Joan. Really appreciate it. And, um, you know, if, if we could all get together in public and not, not too long, which what we might be, we might be able to organize something uh, uh, a, a little more official to, you know, be able to in person thank you. Uh, okay. But again, really, really appreciate everything. Mm -hmm. Thank You'll you probably so be seeing me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank John, you so much. Does, John, does that mean I have to take you off speed dial? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Joan, and thank you for everything. You're welcome. You're welcome. Great. Thanks so much. Um, really excited. We have uh, a, a lot of uh, items on the agenda. Just want to remind uh, the public that um, we do receive public comment and we have received some public comment through uh, the info at Lawrence Alliance for Education.com website and all of those uh, emails are forwarded to board members in advance of the meeting. We review them uh, and they also form part uh, of the public record. So I am looking forward to, uh, again, once we meet back in person to be able to have, uh, you know, I think we'll probably keep the email because it's nice to be able to allow folks to submit uh, written testimony, but 
uh, we'll also go back to in-person testimony as well. So looking forward to that. Um, we're going to jump right into the agenda. Um, I am going to actually uh, ask that the superintendent's report go first. I'll do the report of the chair uh, second uh, because the superintendent and some members of the team uh, will have to go to the city council meeting a little bit later this evening. Uh, they will get a text message at some point because uh, they, they have to go present on some matters. And so I just want to make sure that we have the superintendent uh, here for uh, her report, which are some important items that, that we want to get an update on. So um, that's okay with the board. Again, we'll start with the superintendent's report, then I'll do the report of the chair, and then we'll do the other, uh, the other business. All right, um, superintendent, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I am in a moment. I'm going to introduce some members of our UVOS Council. But I wanted to highlight before we got started that last weekend we had two wonderful celebrations of our seniors to keep everyone safe. And in order to graduate 725 students, we had a morning commencement ceremony followed by a 1 p.m. It was sunny, it was bright, the energy was amazing. Our families and kids um, just do us so proud. So I, I just wanted to share that with you because we've been wanting this last year. As you remember, we did the parade and virtual ceremonies, but there's nothing like having our kids cross the stage in person and seeing the excitement of staff members and families in the community there. So um, really, really a proud moment for LPS last weekend. Okay, and as you can see in your screens, we have additional mem we have additional guests with us. En un momento le voy a presentar a nuestros invitados de tu voz. I ask that you please, if you are bilingual and willing, that you ask questions, comments in both Spanish and English today. I will be uh, doing simultaneous translation for our guest tonight, but first I'm going to be sharing our screen to set the context up and then our guest will be um, taking questions and answering. En un momento voy a enseñarle el, eh, la presentación que nosot nosotros hablamos y después le voy a pedir a los miembros de esta junta que por favor se dirijan a ustedes en los dos idiomas para que ustedes puedan um, contestar sus preguntas. All right, let me share my screen. All right, here we go. So Tu Voz Council is the new name of this group, but you should know that this group has been in existence for several years. Three years ago, we started rethinking and redefining our purpose, our mission, and the structure of this group. Este grupo ha estado en existencia varios años, pero hace tres años atrás nosotros empezamos a cuestionar la misión lo que teníamos que hacer y la estructura de cada uno de nuestros, de las reuniones. So, I'll start with our points of pride, things that we have done together in the past three years. I'll run these through, each slide has them, but here's the snapshot. First, the purpose of the meetings, I has, as I mentioned, the nature of the membership and the meetings, the collective goals, we reflected on our missions, we even changed the logo and the name to reflect that and to be more inclusive. And then we have some tenacity projects that you guys are, uh, will be very familiar with. So this was known as the President's Council and I think the genesis of this and Maria and Denise can correct me here is that each president of the PTO gathered and then met with the superintendent and receiver at the time. And um, it was information gathering, it was also information receiving. And at that time, you know, it was one directional where we just pushed out information and shared things. 
We um, brought facilitators about relevant topics and PD. And then though that we asked those stakeholders to bring it back to their communities in their smaller PTOs. And then there was some time for addressing school level concerns. In 2018, we started that shift from a learning to a leading group. So it was more of a two-way communication, problem solving. We brought problems to the group and helped analyze root causes and then asked them to join us in priorities and setting goals for the problems that we were sharing together. This group is compromised of students, teachers. Um, we do have administrators community members, we even have board members who show up here, and of course, our parents. So here's one of the projects that we um, took on together, one of the goals, and this is attendance. You all know this too well, we've been talking about this for the past three years. So as I mentioned before, this group was um, the one who helped us do a deep dive and an analysis of some of the root causes as a result of that discussion, they created some action steps that included posters, including campaigns to local health clinics, including um, those letters to medical and legal community. And then we started sharing best practices across the district. And also, as you remember, we adjusted the school calendar in that first year to include a two week winter break to accommodate for what families needed, which was time to um, travel without missing school. We reflected on our mission, as I said, what you see here is the inclusive nature of who we are right now. We also thought it was important that we change our logo and our name. And so we embarked in a process where we shared with the members some options for that and what that meant. And that's how we ended up with Duvos Council. They've also participated in district-wide professional development, more um, recently in restorative practices. So we brought Mo to the group and they've also practiced circles and had the experience that staff and our students also experience daily in our school. It was really important for us to include them in this PD because as families, they need to um, better understand and support some of these practices and start slowly helping us change the culture to a more restorative one. This group also was with us in the thick of the pandemic and helped us also create promising practices, both from the teacher lens, student lens, and family lens. And they, of course, also helped us in one of our values, which is self-care and really important during this pandemic. So we did a lot of work around there and did some offerings on how to do self-care. And we're going to continue with this um, attendance challenge. We call it our tenacity project because that is going to continue. As you know, we talked about this as well during the pandemic in the virtual world. We continue to have challenges with absenteeism, chronic absenteeism, and this group continues to be instrumental in that goal. So we're calling that our tenacity project. Okay, let me stop screen sharing because I think I'd rather spend most of our time um, answering questions and having our families, our parents who are here, um, answering any questions that you may have. En este momento voy a dejar que mis colegas hagan preguntas. Les acabo de dar la presentación que ustedes vieron y eso lo habíamos hablado uh, la última vez que nos reunimos. Y estoy agradecida que ustedes estén con nosotros. Si me permiten y si sean tan amables, por favor preséntense, diga su nombre, la escuela que su estudiante está y el grado que su eh, estudiante esté también. Cuando usted, cuando se puede quitar el de mute. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Roberto Rivera, soy el padre de Luz Ros Bailey, una estudiante de nueve años que está en Fraud Middle School en el quinto grado. Buenas tardes. Muy buenas tardes. 
mi nombre es Murbelina, soy madre de Arbelina Díaz, el cual está estudiando en la Oliva. Eh, ella cursa el primer grado y estoy muy satisfecha con todos sus maestros y representantes de la escuela, al igual que la superintendente Cintia, Cintia París, el cual siempre nos da mucha información donde toda la madre tenemos que apoyar a nuestros hijos durante esta pandemia que el cual no ha sido fácil. Gracias. Cindy, I think that you should translate what she just said so for the rest of the benefit of the Thank people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 uh, I apologize for that. So our two parents, one from the Frost, they have a fifth grader, Mr. Roberto Rivera. And then our other family, uh, our other mom is from OPS. She's a first grade, her student is a first grader. And she's mentioned that she um, has been very happy with the teachers and the work that they've done this year during this pandemic and the support that she's received from the district during this time. Thank you. And we're happy to take any questions about the group. And of course, you can address the, the two parents yourselves. Thanks, Superintendent. I, I will go down uh, the order uh, and I'll start with Jess. I, I don't have questions at this time. Thank you. Sorry for being late. I was having connection problems. You're fine. Good to have you. Um, okay, um, Noemi. Yes, I do have a question. La, la pregunta que tengo para los dos padres es, ¿cómo ustedes han visto que este tipo de programa ha ayudado académicamente a sus hijos y también los ha ayudado a ustedes para que apoyen a sus hijos? ¿Qué, qué dos cosas ustedes pueden decir que son las más importantes que han visto en este proyecto? So I'm asking them that out of the project, that, out of, of this project, What are the two things that they have seen that have been the most important uh, in the life of their kids, as well as them as parents supporting their, in their kids' education? Okay, pueden contestar. Okay, um, yo soy nuevo mm -hmm. aquí, pero en los seis meses que llevo aquí y el tiempo que mi hija tiene en la escuela, mm -hmm. he notado un desarrollo y una comunicación social que ella no tenía. Sabes que siempre en algunas escuelas uh, los niños tienen miedo a, lo, a algunos maestros uh -huh. o a algunos uh, compañeros. Eso cambió aquí totalmente. La niña antes tenía problemas para ir a la escuela. Aquí la niña quiere ir a la escuela. Y eso obviamente hay que agradecérselo a todos los profesores profesores y o algo muy importante es la comunicación que tiene eh, tu voz eh, ellos te comunican todo te envían emails te envían mensajes por teléfono hay una interacción que bueno yo yo puedo dejar a mi hija con los ojos cerrados en manos de ustedes gracias, gracias. Superintendent Cynthia, do you want to translate before the other person respond? That's a good idea. Let's try. Si me permite, voy a resumir lo que usted dijo. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you heard the question. He's mentioned that he is new to Lawrence. He's actually new to the country, six months. He shared that his daughter, before joining Lawrence Public Schools, um, wasn't so keen to come to school, but now she's mm -hmm. very excited to come to school. He attributes that to the teachers and the staff at his school. And more importantly, he feels that the communication that is, uh, he's received from both the school and this group Duvos has been the one that supported them throughout this period of time. Great, Noemi. Uh... Other questions or? Yo creo que la, 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 la mamá iba a responder la pregunta también. Ok, ¿verdad? no la he visto, perdón. Sí. Yes. Yes. Um, buenas noches. Eh, primeramente, tu voz es una, 
es un programa que da mucha información, información es muy básica. En cuanto a los padres, para que ayudemos a nuestros hijos a tener muy buena reflexión y, y consta también de que al principio mi hija se sentía un poco triste cuando ingresó al a kinder grado. No sabía inglés. Ella es de nacimiento de aquí, pero al estar con nosotros los padres que hablamos español y los abuelos, se acostumbró y yo le hablaba un poquito también de inglés para que vaya tomando un poco de inglés. Uh -huh. Pero me dieron mucha facilidad en, en la escuela, donde ella se ha desenvolvido muy rápido. Y el cual conocí también ahí a María Campuzano, que fue, <ríe> sí, en ese tiempo la conocimos, donde empezó todo lo de la pandemia. Y ella nos dio un taller sobre cómo podíamos ayudar a nuestros hijos a que desde el principio lleguen a, a, a hacer su estudio muy bien para que tengan buenas calificaciones. Y es muy importante. En Tu Voz Consul siempre nos dan la información, eh, nos llaman, sino eh, también nos dejan mensajes vía correo. En fin, que siempre están ellos preparados para atendernos a los padres y también a, a los estudiantes. Tienen un equipo muy integrante, muy bueno, en cuanto también a los maestros, son muy educativos. También tienen mucha fuerza y coraje para tratar de mantener a los niños que no se decaigan por vía de esta pandemia, porque a veces tienen estrés también los niños. Pero gracias a Dios han sido una básica eh, para nosotros los padres, muy importante, y no me puedo quejar. He, he, he estado muy bien con ustedes y con mi hijo que está aprendiendo mucho. Gracias. Te voy a resumir, si me permite, para que casi no hablan español. So she mentions that the voz um, continues to give her information and via email, text, phone calls, it feels like a lot when I hear her say that we are constantly um, sending the information. She mentioned that her daughter has learned a lot of English, although she was born here and in her, in her family, they speak Spanish, a little bit of English. And so her student has advanced in her English learning skills. She also mentioned that during this pandemic, there were some workshops that Maria Campuzano offered and Maria can speak to that, but we've shared with you a few times some of the offerings and workshops that we give our families in order for them to be better um, engaged with their students. And finally, she says that Tuvos Council has a lot of courage and grit to tackle some of the things that we've endured throughout this pandemic. And again, I'm summarizing. Great. Uh Thank you, muchas gracias. Solo que habla español, no sé ahora de repente como que no puedo hablar dos idiomas. Um, uh, Pat, Mariano. Okay, thank you. And thank you to the parents that are here. Um, I guess someone will have to translate from me. Um, I'd like to know from the parents if they feel that their voice is heard, if they need to bring up an issue to the council, do they feel that their voice is heard and are they comfortable doing that? La pregunta que tiene mi colega es que si ustedes como padres se siente que tienen voz y que se sienten cómodos haciendo preguntas sobre algún problema que tengan. Sí, eh, realmente eh, podemos decir que sí. Eh, uno se siente confiado con el trabajo que ustedes están haciendo. De hecho, es tan importante que mi hija la semana pasada estuvo tosiendo en la escuela, me llamaron, me lo informaron, fui y la recogí, me dieron un papel para que la llevara a consulta y la chequeara. Eh, cuando se le hizo la prueba del COVID salió negativo. Cuando se lo envié a la enfermera, la enfermera me comunicó que tenía que hacer una prueba PCR, y hasta que la prueba PCR no se no fuera enviada a la escuela, la niña no podía regresar. Eso es muy importante, porque eso me dice a mí 
la seguridad que también va a tener mi hija si otro estudiante se enferma o cualquier otra persona. Ya yo tengo la prueba PCR, la envié hoy, mi niña reingresa mañana a la escuela. Eso es sumamente importante en este tiempo. Gracias. He feels comfortable asking questions and the example that he share is one that just recently happened at school where the nurse called, her student had a cough, he was sent to the primary care, the primary care um, had a visit, then he was asked to have his student have a COVID test before the student can come back to school. And in summary, he says that this protocol is um, a safety protocol that he feels confident in because he's reassured that his student will be safe at school if, uh, if this is the protocol that he had to follow, is what he's saying. It's a PCR test, is what he's saying. He cannot return his student without the PCR test. Right. He's in hand, so he's ready. Okay. Um, does our other mom wish to respond? Para mí es muy importante lo que dijo el padre y es muy importante. Sí, es verdad. Ellos nos informan muy bien porque si nosotros necesitamos alguna ropa para los niños, siempre nos están informando de la escuela. Necesitan algo para sus niños o Le hace falta la tarjeta para, para la comida para, para los niños ya por este tiempo de pandemia. O si su niño se siente mal, por favor, no, no duden en llamarnos para un seguro médico. Eso está en que eh, Tatiana Cabaza es una, una muchacha que siempre también nos mantiene informado de todo lo que podemos necesitar en esa escuela. Y no me puedo quejar porque la maestra, Miss Heidi, Y mis cuilan, todos los maestros que mi hija tiene son muy preocupantes por ella y por todos los niños. Y me siento muy a gusto. No me puedo quejar para nada porque como esta pandemia ha atravesado muchas situaciones en cuanto a los padres, los niños y los mismos maestros que están dejando a sus hijos por atender a los de nosotros, es un es un don divino de Dios para que nosotros tengamos presente que todo, aunque no salga bien, también hay un plan que Dios no tiene para que todo esté en tranquilidad. Gracias. Really impossible for me to capture her words. So she agrees with the other parent and shared that during this pandemic, the school staff has been incredible. I'm summarizing. They've reached out and asked, do you need clothes? Do you need food? Um, do you need health care, medical assistance? Um, she's named a few of the staff members who have personally helped her, including Tatiana. And uh, she has no complaints about the, the, the staff and, and the work that they've done for her and her student. Um, I have one more follow-up question, if that's okay. Um, do, do the parents feel that their participation in Tuvo's council could prepare them or they're ready to take on a leadership role in the school as far as the school planning teams, um, deciding budget, deciding what's best for the school when it comes to creating a budget and goals and priorities for the school? I, I will translate um, and then I'll, I'll also come in on that. La pregunta es que si ustedes piensan que su participación en tu voz los ha preparado a ustedes o los le daría la oportunidad de tener eh, voz y voto en la escuela en lo que se refiere a las metas, a lo que se refiere al presupuesto y otras cosas de, de la escuela. Um, just to be clear, at this moment, we have not done in-depth training to families yet about the different structures that are available in the school in terms of integrating, but I did ask the question, so I will let them answer. Thank you. Of course. Según yo he visto, yo soy nuevo, repito, aquí, 
todavía no he participado de lleno en lo que es tu voz, pero los resultados que he visto me garantizan a mí que mi hija está en buenas manos y de hecho yo quiero participar, por eso estoy en esta reunión, porque sí, yo sé que a mí me van a escuchar y yo tengo ideas y quiero decir algunas cosas y quiero contribuir para que tu voz mejore, para que la comunidad mejore y para que todos seamos lo que ustedes me han enseñado, una familia. Gracias. Yes, as he mentioned, he's new to the council, but um, thus far what he has seen is why he continues to be interested in why he's here, because he believes that he does have a voice, he believes that he can influence moving forward, um, and that's why he still engaged and participates in the council. Thank you. And mom? Okay, thank you, gracias. Eh, sí, um, me gusta participar en todas las reuniones porque así me informo mucho más mejor de todo lo que acontece y todo lo que nos falta a uno como padre para aprender. En Tu Voz Consul yo he aprendido que nos invitan siempre a, la, a integrarnos eh, familiarmente para apoyarnos uno al otro. También he, he asistido al, a los talleres que han dado de Tu Voz Consul para que nosotros eh, le enseñemos a nuestros hijos tener un horario flexible de cuando ellos van a, a, se van a acostar, a qué hora se van a levantar, y también de cómo educarlo a ellos, a que tengan paciencia en cuanto a ellos cuando se ponen un poco reverde durante esta pandemia. En fin, que no me puedo quejar. Y siempre estoy poniendo un granito de arena ahí en todas las reuniones. Siempre saco mi tiempecito y digo, no, déjeme yo escucharlo porque eso me conviene a mí y a mi hijo. Y a mi hija, gracias that um, she likes coming to all of the meetings because she's learning um, techniques on how to support her student. The specific example is about sleeping habits and those are the, some of the things that we talk about and self-care. And um, she believes those are good things for her to learn in order to better support her student. Um, I, I've had the privilege to attend a few of the meetings the Tuvos Council. And from my perspective, um, I'm, I'm excited about the energy in the room and the willingness of the parents to put their heads together and to solve an issue. Um, when, I, when I think about the attendance and how it was approached with the root causes, we learned a lot from the parents and from the students that were there, why some of the reasons were the children were absent. And um, I, think, I think this group making that shift from the President's Council was, was a very good move. And I think more parents have a voice in what's really happening in the school and, and a showing their kids that they too can help and be a special part of the school system. So I wanna thank Denise and you, Superintendent, most certainly for taking us in that direction. I'll summarize. And Maria too, I'm sorry, Maria. Um, dice mi colega que ella ha participado de, este, de tu voz y ella es una de las participantes que estaba participando hace mucho tiempo. Y ella ha visto los cambios que han sido para el mejor y le gusta la idea de que ustedes, que nosotros tengamos esa meta de la asistencia y ha visto ese cambio y, y quiere continuar ver otros cambios en, en, el, en, el, en el council. Um, ok. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Dan? Thank you so much. Gracias. Eh, la única pregunta que yo tengo es que quiero saber si ustedes se sienten que si tienen un problema serio o no serio, que no solamente tiene que ser con tu hijo o tu hija, um, pero con algo que está pasando en la escuela, ustedes se sienten um, que tienen el poder en este, en este foro para realmente buscarle solución. Y si sí, si me pueden dar un ejemplo si ya eso ha pasado. Le hago esa pregunta porque yo creo que mucha gente, más gente bueno, hay uno o otro padre que la superintendente eh, cogió, ellos son de ella. Yo quiero saber realmente, es un foro que ustedes pueden dar sus quejas y si eso ha pasado y cómo se sienten ustedes. 
¿Algún me translate that? Eh, hasta so el momento, I, 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 con su permiso, oh, sí. lo, decir, lo otro, sí. So I asked them, like, you know, do they feel that they, this is a form that they can really, they feel that they're empowered to, to make real um, concerns brought up and if they've been resolved, is that, is it, can you give me an example of that? Because some people will say, oh, this is just a couple, couple of fa uh, parents that the superintendent likes and that's her like people. And they, if they can give me an example of uh, an instance where they have used it for counsel to resolve something. A serious or not serious through their kids or some other kids. Bueno, yo iba a contestar, ¿eh? continúo. Sí, puede, sí, claro. Solo. Sí, eh, mira, definitivamente sí. Eh, yo todavía no he tenido un problema, no sé, grande o algo así en la escuela. Una ausencia, porque, no una ausencia, sino que cuando yo la recogía, llegué tarde. Se me hizo tarde para recogerla. Llamé a la oficina, me contestaron inmediatamente, me resolvieron el problema. Cuando yo llegué a la escuela, casi 40 minutos después, estaba una de las secretarias con la niña en su oficina. ¿Tú me entiendes? Eso te da una seguridad a ti de, que, de, de, de tu hijo. Luego, ya que no podía ya transportarla, eh, pedí a la escuela una cómo podía transportar a mi hija, me dieron una lista de unos choferes, los cuales eh, tienen un protocolo de seguridad que ellos saben cuáles niños tienen que llevar y cómo llevar. Y la escuela es que maneja eso, independientemente de que uno lo paga. ¿Tú me entiendes? Entonces, eso se llama organización. Y yo estoy muy satisfecho con eso. Y creo que sí, que nosotros tenemos votos. Yo me siento apoyado. Y sé que cualquier problema que tenga ahí lo voy a resolver con ustedes, claro que sí. The summary is that yes, he does feel like if he did have a problem, he can bring it to the larger group. The example he shares is specific to a uh, tardiness that he experienced picking up his student and uh, the, the school was able to help him resolve it, including giving him resources where he can um, call transportation services to assist with the challenge of pickup. Okay. Um, ¿Va a decir algo también usted o no? Ya. No tiene que decir también otra cosa. Pero... Voy a decir algo. <laughs> Eh, gracias por la información. Eh, sí, la voz de nosotros he escuchado porque sobre el problema de la escuela de la Oliver, eh, invitaron a todos los padres a que por favor participaran. Y, y todos participaron. Fue muy raro que quedó un padre ahí. Y fue, y fue escuchado nuestra voz porque... Ya el siguiente día nos estaban dando información de que sí van a, eh, iban a, a construir la escuela. Y esa es una satisfacción muy grande para nuestros hijos. Porque necesitamos uno, uno de nuestros niños que tengan un área que no haya peligro. Y que en el mañana, por favor, esos mismos niños que están en la escuela son el futuro de que pueda ser uno como usted también. Por eso sí. Mi trabajo siempre es escuchada. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, I can tell she recognizes you from your prior role. <laughs> And I think that's what she's mentioning here. Usted sí lo reconoce a él como el, 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 el exalcalde de nosotros. Ya me di cuenta. Um, yes, so she does feel like she has a voice. Again, the example that both parents are sharing are very specific to schools and uh, nothing has been elevated to the Voice Council because uh, our schools do an excellent job at solving many, many of these problems. But both parents have shared that, yes, they feel comfortable sharing any dissatisfaction or challenges that arise in a larger group. That's just, I just thought it was important to ask that question because, you know, um, one of the things that I think is always interesting is that if there's a group of people who may not even be parents or raising their voice for or against the policy that we have in front of us, I always say, you know, they're, they're really usurping the power of the parents. Uh, and having this council really makes me feel like there's a, a closer touch to the ground and they have that opportunity. 
yo hago esa pregunta porque muchísimas veces eh, hay una persona, un grupo de personas, y a veces ni son padres de la escuela y están quejándose o dando opiniones de cosas que no le importan a los hijos de ellos. Y yo que y, y le coge el poder a la voz de los padres. Pero teniendo ustedes los padres eh, convocados en, este, en estas reuniones con la superintendente, yo sé que ustedes van a mantenerla a ella en línea. Es very true, es muy Así cierto. Así es. <laughs> ok, thank you. Uh, Julio. Thank you, Ventura. Um, no, I, uh, I, I like what I hear and I encourage the parents to continue participating and to encourage other parents to raise their voices as well. Um, este, me gusta lo que he escuchado de los, de los padres que están aquí. Espero que ellos puedan animar a otros padres a participar. Eh, es, o siempre es, it is always interesting to see how new parents and the newcomers are usually the ones that are more interested in the process of education in our city. I wish it wasn't so. I wish um, a lot of the other parents would take on that initiative as well. Siempre es interesante ver cuando algunos de los padres que son nuevos y los padres nuevos, por decir, en el caso de Miguelina que tiene un, un niño pequeño, este, son siempre los que están más entusiasmados en participar en lo que la, el distrito ofrece. Y ojalá que puedan animar a otros a que se activen de esa misma forma. Thank you. I think I translated it, right? Yeah, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, y, y yo tampoco, no tengo preguntas, solamente le quiero dar las gracias por uh, lo que hacen uh, para ayudarnos a nosotros como distrito a uh, escuchar la voz de padres, que nosotros obviamente queremos uh, estar muy asociados con los padres, porque obviamente ustedes tienen más información sobre sus hijos que nosotros, así que es importante que uh, nosotros compartimos esas ideas y, y cómo trabajamos juntos, así que no, yo muy satisfecho y les doy las gracias por todo el trabajo que, que hacen y por estar aquí esta noche con, con nosotros también. Uh, just say, uh, just you know, I just wanted to say thank you for for the work that um, these two parents, but the entire council does. You know, obviously parents have more information about their kids than we do, so we have to work in partnership with them uh, to make sure that again we're we're working together and communicating. And I've seen a lot of evidence of that. I'm just really excited for this this redesigned Tuvos model. Uh, you know, and and just want to really continue to tap it for, as the presentation said, not just information one way, but real dialogue, um, you know, about issues. So, como dije, no solamente es el distrito dando la información a ustedes, pero una manera de, de realmente trabajar juntos um, uh, para resolver, uh, no solamente problemas, pero crear ideas de cómo mejorar. Así que, muchísimas gracias y uh, que, que pasen una buena noche. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Les agradecemos su tiempo. Nos vemos en la próxima reunión. Chao. Muchas gracias y bye bye. Adiós. Gracias, bye. Que tengan una buena noche. Muchas gracias. Bye. All right, Superintendent, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, wonderful. So um, next, the agenda item that we have um, is in your inboxes, uh, a little belated because we were working out some details, but Maciel and um, Chris Merlino in a moment will share more. So we are going to be seeking support from you all on the issue of um, capital improvement plans, but I'm gonna let Maciel jump in here because uh, that's her wheelhouse. But as I understand it, we um, need a waiver and some support from you. So Maciel, whenever you're ready, if you wanna jump in and share with board members uh, the request. Sure, so we are allowed to spend $150,000 per project from Chapter 70 funding um, to repair our buildings and it, ha and it still count towards net school spending. So right now what we're asking is your support in requesting a waiver to be able to spend above that and still have it count towards net school spending. 
and the details of those projects are in your inbox and Chris can also elaborate a little bit further on the four projects that we are um, that we have before you today. Good evening. Uh, would you like to speak, Superintendent? Yes, please. If you would just give us a little flavor of uh, two of the projects, the roofing project and that boiler project, as an example of uh, what we're hoping to accomplish with the additional funding. Uh, most certainly. Um, as you all aware, we're making great strides in fixing the buildings with the city and the CIP plan that they've drawn up. Um, but however, we still have much more work to do. And we have currently on the table the Frost School Boiler Repairs. The boilers are from 1985 original, um, and the city went out to bid along with an architect firm to get the project up and going. The total cost came in at $782,000. The city has in their CIP funds $320,000, so we would have to contribute $462,000. That's an example of the Frost School Boiler Project. Um, with that said, the boilers constantly are breaking, going down. They're beyond their life expectancy, so it's a great fix and a win for the city and the school department. Another example is the uh, Bruce School roof. Um, it was replaced in 1990, so it's beyond its life expectancy. Also, that includes the, the exhaust system, which is the fan system that goes to many classrooms, which is original from 1954. It's antiquated. It does not work. Um, that went out to bid. I uh, came in at um, 1.29. Um, city has 687,000. We would contribute 605,000 to get that project up and going. These projects would take place as soon as school lets out, if we're allowed, on June uh, 16th to start these projects. Um, we have a short time period this summer to get these projects up and going and fixed. And um, that's what we're asking. That's the two examples. We have two other projects. Uh, like superintendent mentioned, it's in your inbox. Uh, one is a concrete project and a window project at the Rollins. Um, so any assistance is appreciated. Uh, it's great for the buildings. It's, it's starting to make great improvements, and we really appreciate it if you would uh, consider this. Great. So I'd like again, to make a motion. Oh, go for it. I just wanted to summarize uh, if that's okay. So just to be clear, the regulation allows for $150,000 per project. As you heard, these four projects will exceed $150,000 $50,000 per project. That means that in order for us to exceed that under Chapter 70, we need to request a waiver to the commissioner. Before we do that, we uh, are hoping for your endorsement, and I heard, uh, and I heard a motion. Um, so I have a motion. Uh, I'll entertain a second, and then uh, we can open for discussion. Do I have a second? Sorry, I think it's Julia. Did I hear a second? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any discussion from board members, and I'll start... Um, with Julia, or actually, I'll just say any discussion because you don't have to have a discussion. Um, the the only discussion that I, the only point that I like to bring up is is there any? In, I I see the projects. I see what these are for. Is there any money set aside to improve the ventilation systems in the schools um, to accommodate you know some of the complaints that we've been hearing from some of the teaching staff and what has happened now with the, the high heat uh, that we've had. At, at this time, there isn't any additional funding earmarked for retrofitting HVACs and or um, installing air conditioning in our buildings. I have had that discussion, Mayor Vasquez, and it's under consideration. Just uh, I, I, uh, would this be a, a good time, uh, considering that we have received additional monies that were not expected for the school district to uh, take into consideration some of those projects? Absolutely. We are always thinking about is there a, uh, when is the right time and what funding can we use for that. Um, we would still need um, waivers for that. The money that we have for ESSER is not specific to facilities and buildings. So it really goes back to the city. And so um, we're gonna pursue that through the city. Thank you. Uh, Ventura? Pat, go ahead and then I saw Dan. Go ahead, Pat. All right, um, I just have a question. Have we applied to MSBA for any of these projects? Under MSBA, as you know, we have two current projects, and then we have another one on roof repairs. I think that's right, Merlino. What's uh, uh, there's one. In 
we're closing out like the uh, superintendent mentioned we're closing out two projects pat and also we have in the pipeline is our oliver school and the Leahy school so um these projects we have to ask for permission and apply it would take years as we are aware um so currently we do not have any other msba projects but these are good projects to get done immediately they're in a desire a desperate need now oh i i understand that we now just for clarification where is this money coming from that the school department is allocating to these two projects? So that, that funding right now is coming from our, our, our local spend. It's coming from the local fund. Mm -hmm. um, That's why I need your approval. All right. Covering we, chapter 70, though. Correct. It is coming out of chapter, chapter 70. Chapter 70. Okay. Thank you, um, Dan. Yes. It's coming out of chapter 70. No. Is this taking away from any educational materials and or services that we would provide the kids? Not at all. Okay, thank you. Dan, go ahead. Um, so uh, the, um, the, uh, I'm just really excited about all this work. It's really great that you can do this thing and, um, you know, I was going to ask the MSBA question. So we do have, besides the building projects, we do have other um, repair projects. Is that what I'm hearing that are in the queue with MSBA? Um, Dan, as you're aware, we just wrapped up the Allenton School Roof and Boiler Project, the North Common Roof and Boiler Project. Um, we will be looking at the drawing board to see what else is eligible. Uh, the criteria also uh, is 25 years plus. So after the frost roof, the next roof would be possibly eligible would be the South Lawrence East coming up next. So, these, so all of these projects fall into this area where they wouldn't qualify from SBA, not because of the type of things, but for different reasons. Correct. Um, and then, okay, good. That's good to know because we should have left the MSBA off the hook. I mean, we should be doing, you know, repair projects that meet those criteria every year. There's plenty of them in the district. Um, and, um, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't want to ask you the wrong question. I mean, I just, I feel like, do we know whether or not the, the commissioner is going to be looking at these with favorable eyes or are we going to, I mean, he, I know he had to do some of this when he was here, but this is a lot. So do we know how this, the commissioner feels about it? I, that, um, you don't have to answer that, Chris, Cynthia, or. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I could say pretty confidently that, you know, he, he understands the, uh, just not to say as, as a chair of the LAE, I do have monthly check-ins with him. Um, and I would say that, you know, I think he probably he, he favorably he recognizes the the importance of these projects and the timing of it. So obviously I can't speak for him, but um, you know we have broached the subject, and I'm pretty confident that if this board supports it, that that he would as well. Um, great. Um, that's all I have. Just on me, any any questions or comments? I, I do. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just, I have like a related question. Remind me on the new Oliver and Leahy school building projects, are those buildings going to have central AC? Okay. They will have air conditioning. That's correct. Yes. Awesome. All right. And so, and Chris, where, where, where does like fixing HVAC and possibly installing or in, because we all we know that those projects are going to take a really long time. They're going to take years to complete, right? Climate change is not going away, and we're having hotter and hotter Junes and Augusts and Septembers. So where are, where do the HVAC projects rank in sort of your total list of things that I mean? I know you you probably have to fix the roof before you fix the HVAC, right? Because you don't want leaks and all of that, but where do the HVAC projects rank? Well, an example of the Bruce School, while we're doing the roof, we're going to be replacing the whole exhaust uh, system. So they coincide with each other. So that's a great example. We're going to okay. put a new roof where we have the roof off. We're taking off all the um, ventilation units and going to replace those. They're from 1954. Um, so that's an example. Um, like you mentioned, the Leahy and Oliver are next in line. Um, those schools, you know, we're keeping our eye on them to make sure we could get we're not going to invest $7 million or $10 million in them, but uh, the superintendent's been uh, paying attention very close to the heat, saying, you know, to try to get them fans as much as we can to try to keep the buildings as cool as possible. Uh, Long-term range, the superintendent and I have had conversations along with the DPW, 
and looking at some of the priority areas, such as um, we actually had an email um, the other day from the South Lawrence East, uh, thanks to Dan Rivera's administration himself. Uh, we have air conditioning at the South Lawrence East for the first time in years. Um, so that was a positive. Um, you know, we're working out some tweaks and little bugs in the system, um, but for the most part, the air conditioning was up and running. Um, so it is a high priority looking at ventilation um, and it's on the drawing board as I met with the superintendent and I believe Mrs. Mariano was in my budget hearing and I asked for funding for HVAC along with the city. Okay, I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear we can integrate it with other projects that are going on because, and I know it's a conundrum because both the Oliver and the Leahy are due to be essentially like renovated and replaced. But in the meantime, we're gonna have a few years of kids being in those buildings, you know, in 98 and 100 degree heat when we have days like we had the last few days. So we Correct. have to do something. Thanks. Thank you, Jess. Noemi? I have a similar question, Chris. My question was, do we have a written plan where we demonstrate the priorities you know, for the different schools addressing the ventilation and the air conditioner? Because it would be good to have like a rough task and timeline, understanding that it's going to take years, but at least, you know, we know that it's heading in the right direction and the prior what is sitting in terms of priorities. Yes, um, we are headed in the right direction. Um, mm -hmm. We do have a plan. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's all funding. Um, at the end of the day, it all comes mm -hmm. to dollars. Um, as the budget was built and we get our new budget in July, we'll take a look at what we have. Mm -hmm. And we do have some priority areas that we would like to get up and running right away. Um, so we do have a game plan, but it all is depending on funding. Uh, this is a small dent of um, projects. There's much larger scale projects we're looking at, um, but this is a great start to these projects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And Dan, I'll come back to you, but I'd just ask maybe, um, and we can work on this, but maybe at a, you know, I'd love to consider at a future meeting uh, to revisit what that plan looks like, uh, just for the board to be able to see it, you know, hear from you, Chris, from the team about how you think about just the priorities, the rank ordering, you know, and, and that would just be helpful, I think, information for the board. So we can work through that. Uh, Most through. certainly. I want to keep in mind too, Ventura, that, you know, we work coincide with the DPW. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the DPW technically, we're the tenants, they're the landlords. Um, but however, we do have a great working relationship. We work together to maintain these buildings for the city and the schools. Um, so uh, we definitely have worked on plans, coming up with plans, and we'll be more than glad to share them. Great, thank you. Uh, Dan, you had a follow-up? I, I just wanted to say that I think that, um, you know, the question that, that Pat asked, you know, about, you know, is this money coming from a place that could otherwise be used for teaching and learning? And um, I think that I struggled when I was uh, the mayor to, with trying to figure out how do we spend more money on creating a space that teaching and learning is more conducive. And if you take a dollar away from, you know, training or, uh, you know, teacher development and a dollar away from, you know, paper and product to make the, to make the space better, you actually are spending money on teaching and learning. And so I wanted to make sure that we're clear about that thing. You know, it says a lot to a student who goes through, you know, first grade through through high school, and 90% of the classrooms he, he or she is taught in don't look great. Tells them maybe that that work that they're doing in there is really not that important. And so I think, it, it, you know, I want to make sure that everybody's clear that when you spend money that's chapter $70, they allow you to do it because something sometimes the, the biggest thing that's impeding teaching and learning is the environment in which it's happening. And so I'm excited that the, the superintendent is using that and even to the extent that they're doing it because it will accelerate. Uh, more kids will have to spend less time in, in and I'll just say, in crappy classrooms. Uh, I really appreciate that. Great, thank you. Um, so at this time, uh, it, the, it, it's been, I've heard a motion and uh, second, um, I'm just going to clarify that the motion is to endorse the superintendent's request to the commissioner to, the, to waive the school finance regulations regarding the certain projects, uh, the building projects that are presented tonight. So that's what we're voting on. Um, so uh, I'll take a roll call vote, Jess. 
Yes. Noemi? Yes. Pat? Yes. Dan? Julia? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So it is approved. Thank you. Thank you. All. Yeah. Great. I'll move us into our next agenda item, which is um, we're seeking a vote for the policies that were presented last month. So in a moment, Denise is going to uh, screen share and as a reminder of what those policies are. Hi, good evening. Um, let me just pull up the document I needed because I grabbed something else in between and here we go. Uh, oh. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that delay, here we go. Um, so yes, if you remember, uh, well, first of all, let me just say good evening and uh, that I'm happy to be here again. Um, if you recall, last month um, we were here presenting on um, six new policies and a procedural document that was attached to one of the policies. Um, and at that time, we requested a vote on the Title IX sexual harassment policy and procedure documents, um, given their timeliness. Um, however, we then requested that uh, we come back in June for a vote on these five remaining policies. So I want to quickly remind you of these five policies. The first is an educational opportunities one. Um, that already exists. This is an update to merely reflect references to Title IX and um, the other policies listed below it. Um, school admissions. Also, the big change there is to update the policy to reflect references to student enrollment rights for homelessness, for military children, for children in foster care. And then the last three are, in fact, new policies. And to clarify uh, or remind, again, We've been implementing the statutory requirements, um, including having um, a liaison, a special, you know, full-time ET, a uh, full-time position dedicated to working with our students at risk um, in, who are homeless, who are foster in military, and working closely with the state to fulfill those requirements. However, um, as we sort of did an audit with them, we realized we didn't have the policies on the books. So it's important to us and obviously to the state that we um, have these policies in place where our families um, can see our commitment to them and understand what their rights are. Are. So at this point, we are in front of you this evening seeking your vote on these and happy to take questions that you may have had from last week's presentation or last month's presentation um, or, you know, any, you know, recent review of, of the new policies. I'd like to make a motion to approve. Unless you need five separate motions. Yeah, that was going to be my my question here. So, I mean, we we've had these Denise. I mean, you know, presented them last week. We've read them. Um, do I need? And I'm looking for, I guess, for you all for, for what approval you need. Do we need to show separate approval for each one, or can we vote on the package? You can vote on the package. Um, our attorney, I think, is logging in. Our legal counsel as well, who could probably um, weigh in. Um, it would be my understanding that as long as you unanimously agree, you could vote on all of them. And then if we ever needed to come back with an update, we would bring them individually if there was an update on any one individual. But, um, you know, that would be my understanding and or we can take some questions while we wait. Uh, I know. Yeah, well, yeah I appreciate that. Let, let's do this. Let, I'm going to open it up to see if board members have questions on any of the policies and then um, just for the sake of being overly cautious, I may, you know, entertain five uh, separate motions. But let me um, let me open it first. Uh, I'll, I'll start with Jess and then uh, go to the alphabet if, if there are any questions around any of the policies. I don't have questions on them. Thanks. Great. No, me. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Pat. 
Sorry, um, mine were answered last month. I'm all set. Yep, Dan? No questions. All right, Julio? Um, I don't have any questions at this time, Ventura. However, I'm going to abstain uh, because this is the first, I was not here for the last meeting and this is the first time that I've seen these documents. So I'm going to abstain. Uh, I'm quite sure that everything that is being put in place, uh, as Denise uh, stated, is for the benefit of having everything written and having it so that the, the, uh, the parents and, and anyone who uh, has any questions can uh, access this information. But I will abstain uh, from voting. Great, thank you. And, and similarly, I had, um, we spent a good time on this last meeting and, and had my questions answered as well. So uh, at this point, do I have a motion to approve the Equal Educational Opportunities uh, Revised so Policy? Moved. All right, do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All right, I'll take a roll call vote. Jess? Yes. Noemi? Yes. Pat? Yes. Dan? Yes. Julia? Abstain. And the chair votes yes, so that is approved. Do I have a motion to approve the new revised school admissions policy? So moved. Do you have a second? Second. All right, any discussion? Hearing none, uh, roll call vote. Jess? Yes. Noemi? Yes. Pat? Yes. Dan? Yes. Julia? Abstain. And the chair votes yes. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the revised homeless students enrollment rights and services policy? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Jess? Yes. Noemi? Yes. Pat? Yes. Dan? Yes. Julia? Abstain. And the chair votes yes, so that is approved. Uh, do I have a motion to uh, ex uh, accept the educational opportunities for military children revised policy? A move. Do I have a second? Second. All right, any discussion? Hearing none, I'll take a roll call vote. Jess? Yes. Noemi? Yes. Pat? Yes. Dan? Yes. Julia? Abstain. And the chair votes yes. Uh, and then finally, do I have a motion to approve the revised educational opportunities, or sorry, it's not revised, the new, uh, educational opportunities for children in foster care policy? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. second. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, do a roll call vote. Uh, Jess? Yes. Noemi? Yes. Pat? Yes. Dan? Yes. Julia? Abstain. And the chair votes yes. So the policies are approved. Um, just want to reiterate, thank you. We said this to you, uh, Denise and the team last meeting when we were, these were presented to us and we discussed them, but just want to thank you again for the tremendous work that went into uh, revising or creating these new policies and, and you know, appreciate that. You know, we had chance to review them last meeting here, ask questions and then have another month to, you know, sort of think further uh, to finally approve them tonight. So just thank you to you and your team uh, for your work on these. I want to say thank you as well. And I, I want to acknowledge Nelson Buten, who's not with us this evening, but as our uh, liaison to the state on the homeless uh, the students, um, he was instrumental in, in helping lead the way on these. So I want to share some of that credit with him publicly. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks again, Denise. So um, next, a summary and update of our summer programming. In a moment, I will share my screen again. You have seen this, but I just wanted to keep you updated to um, what's happening in summer. One moment, please. So uh, we talked about this last time. Let's make sure you can view this. Uh, 
And as a reminder, we have four different programs. We don't really call it summer school. That's not, uh, you know, it's, it, it sort of feels like something went wrong here. On the contrary, we, we think about our students as uh, things that can continue to enrich them, accelerate their, their learning. And in some instances, we do say um, it's still unfinished learning. So the level up as we shared with you all is the students as early as preschool. We're also gonna have a program for the preschoolers. Denise can chime in in a moment about that. But kindergartners up to eighth grade, the high school has a very specific program and that's for credit recovery and expanded AP and elective studies. And of course, our students with special learning needs will have the extended school year. And then our newcomers who will also be participating in programming, including and specifically our SLIPE students. I shared also the weeks and the timing of this this includes five weeks of programming. We have embedded additional support staff. Specifically, we talked about the adjustment counselors. We recognize the difficulties of this pandemic and all agree that adding adjustment counselors to every single program in school is critical here. Of course, we need our nurses. We need our parent liaisons. And then the specialist for the joy factor of this programming. We had shared with you that this is really important to us that we infuse uh, joy throughout the five weeks. Our students haven't had that opportunity in a very long time given the restraints of the pandemic. So um, we'll keep you posted on how the program comes about, you know, I like to share with you all pictures along the way as I visit and uh, talk to students, families, and of course our staff. So I'm happy to take any questions that you might have about the summer programming. Great, thank you. Um, I'll start with Julia. I'm also, thank you. I, I, um, I think most parents are probably looking forward to the summer program. Uh, in order to help their kids. So um, kudos to you for putting this together. Thank you. Great, Dan? I'm just, I just wanna make sure that you had all the resources you needed to kick this off and get this done. I know there was some issues with the city not, not paying some of the bills and all that. And I just wanna make sure that we're, you know, is, are you all set? Is this gonna be what you needed? Cause I, I think it's, you know, that the, um, this is such an important program that I just want to make sure that it's all that we needed to have. Because if there is some issue still, I think it's I need to make sure that um, we communicate that with the city that you know you know the resources that needed to run this appropriately, you know we're not you know it's not being processed right. Thank you. We did have um, some lessons learned as we were building the summer programming. We had to pivot to a different model. We are confident that this model continues to be the right model for our students, which um, encompass, of course, the academics, but more importantly and dear to my heart is the joy factor here and the enrichment opportunity. So our specialists stepped up to the plate and we still have partners that are supporting. So this model is a little bit different than we have dreamt up. The original model had the partners coming to students in this model now we have specialists who are integrated during the day in the academics as well as having students participate in enrichment outside of the schools um, with our partners all right as long as we you know as long as you know the the adaptation did not take away from the experience um because that was unfortunate thank you so much that's all i have thanks pat Yes, thank you, Ventura and Superintendent. Um, I have a few questions. One, how are we um, soliciting families to participate? Sure. So school-based teams are identifying students, and those um, students then are contacted by school-based teams. A few of the criterias are, uh, of course, the academic piece, but as I mentioned, and you'll hear me repeat this a lot, the social emotional aspect also is a criteria that's really important for participating in the summer programming. So it's not just specific to academics. Well, I'm glad to hear the social emotional piece is being emphasized. We all agree that this has been a difficult year for the students. Um, I had 
an outside the box thought and um, maybe we can discuss it. I see at the K to eight level, you're looking at a 30% enrollment. What happens if you don't meet that target enrollment? You have empty seats available. Have you thought about what could possibly, what we could do in that instance where we're paying for a program and not filling the seats? Sure, so the 30% is because we do keep the student to teacher ratio manageable in addition to um, that staffing criteria. We also wanna be able to manage safely the space in all conditions, not just the COVID, the heat, um, everything else that happens in the summertime. Uh, and we are very, very close, if not already full, with our 30%. So we right. Again, one other question as far as um, the city. Um, I think we'll all agree that, again, that this has been a very difficult year. Have we thought about opening our summer program to students who are not enrolled in the district and giving students our Lawrence kids, whether they're LPS kids or whether they're um, private school or whether they're homeschool children, the opportunity to participate in a program in the, in the light of the fact that this has been a very difficult year for them. Sure, so uh, our policy is that any student who is enrolled in the Lawrence Public Schools is a candidate to participate in the programming. With respect to homeschool students, they are also part of the district and they account for those numbers. With respect to students who are participating, who are in uh, private or independent schools, we have not done that. I'm happy to discuss that further with um, my colleagues and I don't know what exceptions we can make to that, but I'm, I'm happy to further discuss that. I, I'm just thinking of the students all the students in the city that have had a very difficult year. And as September approaches and the kids need to go back to school, if we can help out the other kids in the city as well as our own, if we have slots available, then why not do it? It just makes sense because those people, those children are our Lawrence kids also. Sure. And, um, as an example, students who have an IEP, those are students who are welcome to our summer programming because they are... Um, they can they can participate of those resources and supports. Okay, so you will take some time to look into that to yes. see if that's a possibility. Happy to to look into it. Thank you, thank you, Superintendent. No further questions. The witness may rest. I, I, I don't know. I'm trying to make a joke. All right. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, no, me. <laughs> I don't have any questions at this point. Thank you. Okay, Jess. I'm good. I was just going to recommend some water balloon fights as part of the curriculum, but other than that, I have no comment. Great. I, I just have a uh, maybe a comment and a question. Um, the uh, you know Dan um, referenced um, you know to just some conversations or ongoing conversations we've been having with the city around uh, processing of payment, and you know I know the superintendent and her team. Uh, continue to work with the city just to, you know, make sure we're clear on the process and timeline and things like that. Uh, I do want to say, though, in talking to the superintendent and her team, you know, about this summer program, like, you know, this is an area where I think as the superintendent said, there are, you know, we've sort of looked closely at lessons learned in terms of who the partners could be and the timing and things like that, where the district had a vision for a program that was I think, you know, a, a certain way, but I think it has been helpful as I look at the model and have, you know, sort of understood it over the last uh, several weeks that they were able to, um, you know, keep the enrichment component within the program itself. And so we're not losing that. And I guess I just want to say directly, while I am working with the city and the district is working with the city and, you know, we're going to keep, uh, you know, sort of pressuring to make sure that, you know, we have bills paid and things like that. I don't think the change in this model was directly related to uh, that issue, you know, that we're continuing to pursue with the city. So I'm happy to hold people accountable. In this case, I just don't think that was like the reason, you know, for, you know, exclusively for the pivot. So I just want to be, you know, sort of uh, uh, clear about that. Uh, that said, I think that part of what we've learned is just, again, like having, um, uh, just, uh, again, a longer sort of uh, lead up time to make sure we have 
things in place so that the vision for uh, an even more robust summer program uh, can be in place. And so, you know, happy to support you, superintendent, the team as you, you know, as we offer this great program and then think already about like, what does next summer look like, you know, to make sure that that we can, uh, you know, expand that if that's what you all wish to do. Uh, the, the other thing, I guess just two quick questions. Um, uh, let me just narrow it to one, actually. Um, in addition to the programs that we offer, can you or someone talk a little bit about just the other programs? Because we have partners that work with us during the school year, uh, you know, who I think we would like to maybe work with us more in the summer, but that's where I'm talking about, like, it would take a little bit more sort of creative thinking and, and how we do that. But they, they continue to offer programs uh, in the summer. Uh, and so can you just, just someone share a little bit about what are those additional programs for, for a child in Lawrence, as Pat said, like our, our program is one option, but they can, you know, access others or they can access both. So just maybe a little flavor of what are those kinds of programs that are available to our, uh, to our students? Sure. So, of course, they have access to the big names that you all know, the YMCA, the um, Boys and Girls Club. Um, I'm going to confirm with my colleagues, but we also have access to the rowing that um, the boathouse. So those are just a few of them. YDO. We, Running away. We have, um, so that, those are some of the programs that our students, partners that our students have access to. I'm sorry, I, I lied. Just a follow-up question. Do we, when we advertise our programs, um, do we also help get the word about, about some of those other programs as well? So I'm, um, did you like me to jump in? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, we've been using social media to push out our partners' programs um, and sharing their flyers with schools to, you know, send home with the students who are in school. Um, I also wanted to highlight um, an enhanced partnership that's taking place among um, our early childhood partners. Um, again, a lot of time and energy thinking about how we support um, our youngest learners and who maybe didn't participate in kindergarten or didn't participate in um, uh, yeah, in kindergarten or preschool, um, or, you know, had a hard time staying engaged. So um, thanks to United Way, who has received um, a very large uh, donation from uh, early education and care, we are collaborating with four community partners, uh, the community group, GLCAC, YMCA, and YWCA, to provide free of charge um, programming space seats in their programs, basically seats in their programs subsidized by the United Way funds. Um, and we're happy that we're going to be, it's, it's come together incredibly late. Um, we are putting the finishing touches on an invitation to all of our rising first graders and then um, all of the children who have already registered for kindergarten to date, and then we'll keep giving out the flyer as we continue to register kindergartners, inviting them to um, review the programs, and there's a contact, a special contact at each program where they can reach out and see if there are still seats available. It is first come, first serve at this basis, but they, at this point, but they all have space. And as I said, it's, it's subsidized through the uh, early education and care funds that are going through United Way. So we're super excited that, you know, we really think hundreds of kids can take advantage of this opportunity. We, you're on thank, mute. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, um, great. And again, just, just want to reiterate, I mean, I know this is, and I say this every meeting, it's maybe getting old, but like, this is a, uh, uh, a pretty extraordinary year. I mean, atypical in all the work that, you know, all of our staff, our teachers, just all staff members in the district have had to do. And so I just appreciate, um, you know, uh, a robust summer program, which I know we typically offer, but this year, just to, it's even, it feels even more important, you know, uh, to make sure that our kids have access to both what we offer. And again, um, everything the city has to offer, and we're blessed to have so many partners and um, it sounds like you all are doing, as you always do, direct proactive communication with our families, but maybe just uh, publicly to say if, if people have 
questions or want to know how to access any program, whether we offer it or one of the partners in the city, like who can they contact? Now you're on mute, Denise. <laughs> They can certainly call the Family Resource Center um, during business hours. It's 978-975-5900. Um, um, if their children are currently in school, they can certainly talk to the parent liaisons um, at their schools. Um, all of us are really you know, eager to help. Um, they can also email um, LPS help at Lawrence Public Schools or Lawrence, you know, .k12.ma.us. Um, but uh, we've kept that helpline email open all year long. So um, lots of ways, but probably the most direct is to reach out to the Family Resource Center. Great, thank you so much. All right, Superintendent, I'll turn it back over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much. So next agenda item, it's an update about our earned autonomy framework. My colleagues, Elizabeth Daniel from CEPRIL and her colleagues are on the call. And in a moment, they're gonna be sharing their screen. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, um, LAE board. Um, we are excited to meet with you and get started. My colleague, Chris, is gonna share his screen and um, we will be presenting about um, an update on the Earned Autonomy Framework uh, and uh, the menu of autonomies and supports. Um, Chris, are you able to share? Great. Um, so before we start, um, Chris, you can go ahead and put um, uh, the deck up. Um, uh, my name is Elizabeth Daniel, and I'm the project director at CPRO, um, the Center for Public Research and Leadership at Columbia. Um, and I am joined by my colleagues, uh, Porvija and Sangeeta, and then uh, Chris, who is sharing his screen. Um, I'm sure most of you at the LAE remember CPRO's work from last year, and uh, Maddie Sims, who led our project last year, and she sends her regards to all of you, and she's kind of been keeping up with the work. And Chris, who is present on the call now, was also a part of that work last year. Um, over the last several months, uh, our CPRO team has had the honor of working with a range of stakeholders from the Lawrence Public Schools and some members of the LAE to build on last year's project, developing that earned autonomy framework. Um, as all of you know, and has been mentioned several times on this uh, meeting, um, it was a year of unprecedented challenge. Um, and we cannot say enough from our CPRO team side about how impressed we were across the board with the commitment of LPS teachers, principals, and central staff to thinking through um, Lawrence's gifts, Lawrence's challenges, and where things could improve. Um, even while facing these um, pretty incredible challenges. Um, and we're looking forward to presenting what we have learned over the course of the last year, or not year, but since January, and um, sharing some of our recommendations and then hearing your questions and comments. Um, the focus of our presentation today um, is going to be to review a proposed menu of autonomies and supports and then share some more general recommendations on the framework and implementation of that menu. Um, and then uh, we also want to foreshadow a little of the work we're doing on target setting just so you know where we're going. And so we'll do a quick refresher on the earned autonomy framework. Those of you who have not been focused on this work, but the incredible um, work of LPS generally that you have to focus on probably don't um, remember all the ins and outs of the earned autonomy framework. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the working groups and the implementation work that's been going on in what we call the phase two work. Uh, then we're going to focus on the autonomies and supports, uh, both the menu itself and the implementation. And then we're going to go over some recommendations. Um, and so that the agenda I just went over is pretty much the same as the um, uh, uh, our objectives for the day. Um, and we look forward at the, uh, to getting your questions. You can pop them in the chat or you can save them to the end, whatever works better for you. Um, uh, and then Chris, let's go on to, um, oh, so we're gonna first provide you an overview of the earned autonomy framework. You probably remember it from last year. Uh, but because it does provide the real key context to our 
to our discussion today, we do want to do a quick refresher. The framework grows out of the open architecture model that was a key driver of the early turnaround work at, at LPS under Jeff Riley's leadership. And it emphasizes the importance of school autonomy in driving um, educational and, and school improvement. But as the district evolved over the next five or six years, um, there was a growing sense that many aspects of the um, open architecture model needed clarity and that schools in the district were poised um, for more focused improvement efforts. So in January 2020, LPS engaged CPERL to undertake the work of trying to clarify and codify the open architecture model. Over the course of several months uh, last year, even as the pandemic was hitting, uh, CPERL conducted intensive stakeholder outreach and developed a school performance and improvement tool that was given the name, the Earned Autonomy Framework. Uh, that was presented in several different iterations to this um, group. And in June, the LAE approved the Earned Autonomy Framework. And that brings us to what we call phase two, the implementation phase. Um, and uh, for that, over the last few months, um, we have been working with uh, two working groups that were convened by LPS in order to support the implementation, one called an Applied Autonomies Working Group, the other one a Target Setting Working Group. Um, and so uh, just to refresh on what the purpose of the earned autonomy framework is, it's to uh, build the district and school capacity for school improvement that's data driven. It's to allow the district to proactively identify schools in need of support and intervention, provide useful and nuanced information on school strengths and challenges to support planning. And then it also wants to honor autonomy as still a component of school improvement. And then it, it also supports um, the annual designation of schools to help the district and schools identify what autonomies and supports would be best for that school. Um, so we're gonna go a little bit, we're gonna show you a little bit about the um, framework itself. Um, uh, and so we wanna look at how a school can use the framework to get better. How does it actually work? So this is a snapshot um, from the Earned Autonomy Frameworks dashboard. Um, if you looked at it last year, that this may seem familiar. You can, this one is focusing on um, the area, the domain called the academic experience. Um, it tracks a number of different types of performance in this area and attempts to have schools um, set a target and then confirm each year how they're progressing towards that target. It identifies data collection tools, particular types of indicators to show how well a school is performing on any particular act, action. And then the domains themselves, there are eight domains that are tracked in the Earned Autonomy Framework. The first four that we usually look at are the ones that are called process indicators. Um, that covers academic experience, and school environment, family and community, and school operations. And then the outcome indicators are the uh, cover academic engagement, academic growth, academic achievement, and academic success. And so you know um, uh, these go much broader than the uh, standard DESI um, indicators and accountability indicators. This is trying to get at a more local and nuanced version of how a school is performing. Um, but in order to kind of check on how the schools are doing under the framework, there is a scoring system that was developed in the work last year. Um, and uh, um, it, that sort of sets out a score of zero to four based on whether the school meets its target. Um, it may improve, but be below target, and so it still gets some credit. Um, and uh, that goes for each of the domains. So all of the indicators in any one domain roll up basically into a score for their performance on that one um, uh, um, domain. And so that kind of brings us to um, phase two, um, and that's the working groups and the implementation work that we have been doing at, um, uh, with the working groups of, since January. Um, so for the past several months, we've been facilitating this work, focusing on developing a menu of autonomies and the target setting process that folds into the work of the um, framework that you saw that there's the scoring and the scoring is based on targets, but you have to figure out how you're going to set those targets. 
Um, we worked very closely with the two working groups that included principals from all grade bands, teachers, the central office, um, all with the goal of developing recommendations on the target setting and the menu of autonomy supports. And uh, we'll make those recommendations in more detail at your August meeting. Um, just so you know uh, the depth of um, sort of stakeholder feedback that we got and worked with, we had four meetings with each of the working groups. And the working groups, again, were comprised of LPS principals, teachers, parents, and central staff. Um, uh, we did at least 10 interviews with some of these stakeholders. And then we did additional meetings, like with the full principal group, the principal advisory committee. And then we met several times with different parts of the central staff. And then we had a number of like sort of one-off meetings and, and met with the full high school team as well, knowing that that's an unusual setup, the way the high school works in terms of this um, work. Um, so the recommendations that we're gonna make you tonight and the structure of the menu we're about to show you um, are based on the, the feedback and the work that, that we got last um, over the course of the last several months. And also, just so you know, if, if you had a chance to look at the menu we, we shared with you um, last week, you can see that there are gaps in the menu. They're, they're placeholders. And that's going to be a lot of our work this summer, now that people at central staff and even some of the principals have a little more time to make sure that the, the, the things that we are creating here are responsive to the actual reality of the LPS schools. Um, and so um, just a little bit about the um, menu itself. Um, uh, you might be thinking like, what is a menu of autonomies? And um, now we are calling it a menu of autonomies and supports in part because of the feedback we got. Um, but we want to think a little bit about how having a menu might help the district and help the schools um, um, manage towards improvement better. And so one of the things that the menu does is it makes clear a vision of how the LPS community wants to use these autonomies and supports. It also supports the principals in understanding the scope of their decision making, sort of like where they have autonomy to make decisions and run their school the way they want to run it. It also explains the process more clearly around how those autonomies and, and supports can be accessed. And then it also defines um, how the central office and schools will collaborate to improve the student learning. And finally, it makes clear the link between the autonomies and supports and the performance as it's articulated under the framework. Um, and so the menu, which we shared with you last week, um, is built around um, six areas of autonomy. And these areas were ones that we identified through a close review of past LPS practice contributions from the working group members, and also desktop research about effective practices in other districts. I mean, so those um, areas of autonomy are curriculum and assessment, staffing, professional development, budget, schedule and calendar, school culture, and policies. Um, over our several months of facilitating with the working groups, we learned that there was an interest in ensuring that this is a collaborative process. Um, and that uh, that's the process of um, managing the autonomies. And um, there was also an interest in linking supports to the management of the autonomies. And so our, our menu as it was developed reflects that. Um, uh, because the framework is designed to help LPS and the schools identify closely where support is needed and to provide different levels of autonomy depending on how a school is performing, we um, also propose certain designations for the schools. Um, those um, are called at this point, succeeding, developing, and focus schools. Um, these names are not written in stone, but um, are just the um, names that we thought best reflected at this point, um, how the process is working. But we've had a number of folks think that succeeding should be called um, something else. Um, and so we would welcome your thoughts on that. And we'll continue also to seek stakeholder feedback on that. Um, and you can see that this sort of sets out that like a really strong performing school under the framework um, is called succeeding. Um, those who are um, improving in most areas, but not necessarily meeting target in, in a number of areas 
um, uh, are developing schools, and then there are the focus schools, which are facing uh, more challenges. And the idea here is that by giving the schools designations and showing like where they are strong, which domains and categories, it allows the district and the school to kind of dig underneath to see what's actually going on in the school, to think of where they need more support, where they might be able to work with other schools to improve, and then also where they are um, able to exercise autonomy around their decision-making at their school. Um, and so the way our uh, framework is laid out kind of reflects that philosophy that the succeeding schools have full autonomy in, in the different areas. Developing schools have um, either full or guided autonomy, and that's a very collaborative process where you look at, um, more deeply at performance on the framework. And then, um, and then the focus schools have much more limited autonomy, sometimes perhaps no autonomy, um, and the district approves most of their planning work. And you can see on the grid here that there are different levels of supports, depending on what um, how the school is doing on its um, earned autonomy framework. Um, and so this is the general layout. This is for curriculum. Um, and so I just want to let you see what that looks like, and then I'm going to walk you through the different categories. And so for each category of autonomy, the, um, the menu sets out something that says schools can, and this kind of defines the decisions that schools and principals can make for themselves. Um, it's also sort of like a description of how the autonomy would work. And then we have the conditions, and these are um, uh, areas where um, that shape or limit the practice of autonomy. These are usually non-negotiable rules that have been set by the state or the federal government or the district. So here you can see that all curriculum must align with Massachusetts frameworks. Um, all curriculum must have supports for English language learners, students with disabilities, and other high needs students. Um, and then we've outlined a process of implementation for each autonomy. Um, and in each one, because we're still sort of working with the district um, and some of the principals to identify the best way to art articulate what this process should look like, we have left some, um, some blanks here. Um, but in general, the idea is that schools would let the district know that they want to exercise autonomy in a certain area and submit a plan around how they're going to do it. Um, and as you'll see in a few minutes, this is um, we're, we're, we think this needs to be aligned with the current or any revised um, overall planning process at the district for the schools each year. I mean, then the next part of the menu is sort of like where it sets out um, what levels of autonomy, what how you exercise autonomy in any particular area given um, your level of autonomy. For instance, the most schools we think will fall in the developing category where they um, work with the district to define um, where their autonomies are on, on the particular categories. And then again, for each one, there are different types of supports. For instance, here, if you look down at the bottom, it says standard district supports. Um, which again, in the area of curriculum, it would be provide a menu of approved and recommended curricula. Uh, district funding may be available for approved curricula. And then, so those supports would be available to all schools. And then um, for schools that are in the developing category, they could get additional coaching. Um, and then focus schools get um, more support from the school and more guidance over their actual selection of uh, curriculum. And it, these areas of the supports um, are the areas where we need to do um, sort of more work and build it out by having time with folks at the district and some of the principals. But um, we did hear again and again that um, principals really want that menu of approved and recommended curricula and um, really want a chance to like see um, the district's best thinking of what are the good curricula out there. Um, uh, so again, this is how the menu works as a whole. Um, you can see, um, so there's a page like this, as you probably saw in the materials we shared with you, for each um, autonomy that we have identified um, uh, for the menu. 
Um, and then obviously a critical part is how these will be implemented over time. Um, and so we developed a process on um, how to, to implement the, um, the autonomies each year. Um, but first, we just want to eat. It depends on whether you are at the succeeding, developing, or focus level, exactly how it works. Um, and then so uh, we set out in the, the, in the documents we distributed to you, um, there's a much more detailed version of this slide um, setting out the menu um, and the process. Um, but number one, we think recommend that the district develop a, um, a district-wide strategy each year and share that around how the autonomies and supports um, will be used to improve learning outcomes. And earlier in the school year, they circulate a menu of what autonomies and supports will be available to school, and then also set the standards for school designations. Um, the recommendation that we made around school designations, we don't think necessarily will be static, but should probably be revisited. Um, on a regular basis in order to make sure that it still aligns with how the district wants to be proceeding. Um, and then for this work, we looked closely at the current district planning process and um, tried to align the timing with that planning process where schools submit their operating plans to the district. Um, and uh, we do understand that that's not a static process either and that um, some of this work could be um, part of an overall revision of the planning process. Uh, but what does seem important to us is that um, it aligned with whatever else is going on because you don't wanna have principals in the district having to do two processes like this each year. But beginning in January, schools would receive their preliminary scores on the earned autonomy framework and their preliminary designations. And then the schools would have an opportunity to reflect on those scores um, and, and a kind of self-assessment process uh, because the scores also are for the schools. They're not just for the, to, to manage other processes that helps the school see where they need to improve or where they're feeling really strong. Um, and so, uh, but then they would use that reflection process to submit an application to the district for the autonomies that they think that they want to exercise for that year and then the supports they think they need uh, for that year. And then in March, um, the schools and LPS collaborate around the autonomies and supports um, based on the designation, the framework performance, and other data that the, the principals may want to share, and then the school operating plan process. Um, in May and June, the schools um, will get an opportunity to um, kind of revisit their designation and preliminary award based on year-end data. Um, and in the, the following school year, which is when these levels would really apply, um, uh, principals and LPS um, can conduct what's called a leveling review at at least some districts that do this work where they say, um, maybe we need to revisit some of this. Um, it is an intensive process, and we under, but um, we did get a lot of positive feedback from principals about it. Um, there is, uh, it does need to be something again that aligns with other processes at the district so that it's not a completely separate heavy lift for everybody. Um, and so then as a part of this, we have drafted a number of recommendations. Um, uh, first, uh, based on uh, feedback and things we've heard about the earned autonomy framework itself. Um, we, uh, we think that the district needs a comprehensive communication plan uh, to share information and about the earned autonomy framework itself, the menu, and any implementation plan and processes so that it's, it's um, part of a coherent um, initiative and doesn't seem like it's like a one-off um, thing that's happening to schools um, and people in the district. Um, we also um, think that you should consider changing the name of the Earned Autonomy Framework. There was a fair amount of um, kind of resistance about the kind of message that that was sending from the framework, uh, about the framework. And so people had ideas for things like a school improvement framework or a school empowerment framework, um, uh, something to, again, make it um, more collaborative and um, more about the partnership between the schools and the districts towards improvement. Um, we do recommend that you um, adopt a phased implementation, uh, considering the significance of an initiative like this and what it asks of the schools um, and the district. 
um, and that the, the district and the schools are likely to be facing significant challenges as they transition back into full regular schooling next school year. Uh, there's a, the need to have training for district staff and principals on this. Um, and uh, we do think that um, the district should identify a point person to manage all of this uh, in an ongoing way. Um, and then to consider creating a principal steering committee to um, work with the district on implementation and building buy-in. Um, finally, we have a number of recommendations about the menu of autonomies and supports itself. You know, the menu of autonomies and supports is itself kind of a recommendation. Um, and uh, we do, um, you know, recommend the different components of that. We also recommend that there is a process of managing the autonomies that aligns with existing or revised planning processes. Um, and that any of this includes a school self-assessment to make sure that the school is a, um, a strong player in the designation and planning process. Uh, we also think that there needs to be a, a built-in process for reviewing and revising the menu over time as it is implemented and you learn what works and what doesn't work. Again, we think that training is important here and um, uh, and we think that however, the, the way this is rolled out with the autonomies and support should be managed uh, to build school capacity to make the strategic and data-driven decisions that are supposed to be underlying all of this to really help improve student learning across the board. Um, and so uh, the next steps that we see here um, are, uh, we have a number of tasks that we're going to be performing over the course of the summer, working closely with the central office and principals to sort of clarify some of these supports um, and integrate additional supports as needed. Um, if you if you got a chance to look fully at the menu, you can definitely see where the supports um, could be built out to be more reflective of actual LPS reality. Um, and then to also one of the key areas that we have um, struggled to define just right is the scope of budget autonomy and how it affects other areas of autonomy. Um, obviously, if you have curriculum autonomy but you don't have any money that autonomy is somewhat limited. Um, uh, and that goes for staffing and um, professional development and other areas as well. And they, they all do overlap to some extent. Um, uh, we also plan to complete and finalize the implementation plans. Uh, we're going to work on tailoring uh, the process and menu specific to the Lawrence High School and the academies. Um, and uh, we also want to identify processes for streamlining this planning and application process so that it's not a burden on uh, the schools. Um, and uh, we also hope to support the development of a pilot that could be used to really kind of pressure test some of this um, early next, uh, over the course of next school year. Um, and then we, we are still working on the target setting process and we'll provide you with more um, recommendations on that process at your August meeting. And so our timeline, as I pretty much uh, gave in more detail, is to continue working with the principals and LPS to clarify the menu and implementation, to collaborate with the principals and LPS to build out the target setting process and hopefully pressure test the framework by working, um, actually putting in some of the data to the framework and seeing uh, how that works. Um, uh, particularly for target setting. Um, and then in August, we will present our final recommendations to you on the menu of autonomies and supports, the implementation processes, and the target setting process. Um, and so we wonder, does anyone have any questions? Hi, Cynthia, you're still here. Um, I, don't, I don't have a, well, it's, I have sort of a question slash comment, which is that I, I think your point that this is a, a lot to absorb, right? And that there's there's quite a bit, like it, it's gonna be super important to integrate this process into kind of existing planning and budgeting and evaluation processes for each school because otherwise 
I, I mean, I think this is terrific work and I think it's an important framework to put in place. I'm just a little worried, you know, that as you said, like in the fall, we're also going to be transitioning back mostly into more normal operations, hopefully post COVID knock on wood, there's going to be all of that to manage and then integrating this new approach. And I'm just a little worried about teacher and administrator burnout and how we're really making this work with things that are already happening or in place or what we're letting go of so that this can fill up that space. Um, so I don't know if that's you or Cynthia um, that needs to answer that, Elizabeth, but yeah. I mean, we hear you also just based on what we've heard from folks, and, and I think Cynthia probably can really speak to this as well, just the realities of what bandwidth people have right now. And this is a pretty significant initiative. Um, and so our goal right now um, is to get this as ready as possible. Um, but knowing that it may take a little, it may take time and um, more time than it would be in other years to roll something like this out. And we will, you know, take our cue from the board because you guys are the ones who will set this policy and, um, and Cynthia, uh, but, um, because you're the ones obviously who will be the ones to implement um, as it is. I agree. I think we'll take guidance from you all and for sure feedback from those who are actually going to be implementing. I do think that the timeline allows for thoughtful piloting of the implementing of some of this, but certainly um, looking for additional feedback and guidance from you all. Yeah. yeah. I if I could just say, um, I know I'm out of order, I'll go to Noemi next, but um, so Pat and I have had a chance uh, to serve on uh, the different committees that are looking at, uh, you know, the autonomies themselves, looking at, again, implementation questions. And one thing that I've really appreciated is because we have teachers, we have principals, we have staff, like, as part of those committees, like, they raise those questions, like, all along the way, you know what I mean, in terms of, like, uh, I remember being in conversations, I think, last week where, again, like the epiphany, it sort of hit me after months of, of uh, thinking about this, that, again, like this, is, this has to align, as um, the presentation said, to things like a planning process. So it doesn't feel like an additional lift, but it really is about um, school improvement. And even so far as like the timing of when that actually happens in the year, you know what I mean? Like when a principal actually has enough information uh, to set meaningful goals with his or her staff for next year. Like we have to pay attention to those very real realities, just the realities of, of uh, being in schools and running schools. And, and again, because we have those folks in the room or, or virtually, you know, uh, working with us, um, I've seen how, this has already sort of been shaped and, and will continue to be shaped. Well, you know, the board will have to provide, ultimately, you know, we will, you know, vote on this. And if that's, this is the direction we want to go, we'll, we'll, we'll signal that. But I think continuing to take our lead from the experience of those who are then going to be implementing this, you know, with the district and in schools uh, has been a hallmark of what's happened so far. And I just think has to continue uh, to the points brought up of this has to work. You know, it can't be so overburdensome that, it's, it's a beautifully designed thing that we just can't do. Like, you know, so to the degree that we are thinking about, uh, as the superintendent said, piloting, phasing in, like, you know, like the pieces that, of this that are, that are critical and, you know, in a way that is thoughtful and recognizes everything our, our staff does. I just, that has been a hallmark of how this is being designed and just, I guess I'm, I'm underscoring that it will continue to be, uh, you know, because we want to get this right. We want to actually have this lead to uh, what we're designing it for, which is identifying uh, areas of need, support, autonomy, you know, and letting sort of uh, having us at the board be able to communicate that to our broader community, like at the end of the day. So, um, okay, it's not my turn. So I'm going to turn to me. Do you have any questions? I get to sit on these committee meetings, so I get to be very deep in, in, in the content of this. But Noemi, any initial questions or thoughts? I don't have any initial questions. The, the information presented was very thorough and you know and I really appreciate going through the details 
My only comment and I, is something that you mentioned about changing the name. And I really like that idea because it, it shifts the, the, uh, the framework and it also shifts the mentality on what this project is about, which is not about being punitive, but about like providing the resources so people can actually do their best. So I, I, I like that idea, changing the name. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Well, I also had the pleasure of serving on the group, and um, I'm not going to be as verbose as uh, Ventura was, but I, I know, I see you. Um, what, I, what I really appreciated was the voices of the teachers and the principals, and um, I felt like it was giving them this, a level playing field and giving them things to achieve. Um, and to demonstrate what they're doing. And in, in other ways, it's looking for support if they needed support. So um, I'm really impressed with the whole project and I'm, I'm anxious to see it move forward. Um, it was my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, Elizabeth, that we were gonna do some kind of a pilot this the next school year and then look for Im implementation 22-23. So it isn't that we're going to say to the schools, this, here it is, September, you know, this is what you're going to have to do. I think there's a very thoughtful way of implementing it in the schools. Um, and then just one other thing, I've been thinking about your word succeeding. Might you consider the word accomplishing? Or accomplished, or maybe. Accomplished. Well, yeah. I'm looking at, you know, succeeding, developing. So I went with accomplishing, but you can change it up however you feel, but that I like the sound of that for that first um, group. Yeah, that's nice. As Cynthia can testify, we have um, gone back and forth over what to call, particularly that first group. That's the one we <laughs> stuck on. Um, uh, but that, that's, a, that's another good one. Um, thank you. All right, thank you. Great, Dan? I have a lot to say about this, so I'm going to be more of a burst than, than no, I'm not. That's not true. Um, I, I just, I do want to say that I think um, anyone listening to our questions will think like some of them are kind of superficial. I am just so thankful that this is thorough. I think it's, uh, I, I'm glad that it continues to work that, um, you know, former receiver Riley did and that we got so much Herald, you know, like we got just so much love for across the nation. Um, and we saw this as a successful thing. And I think putting this, the details uh, kind of out there so people really understand how we're doing it and getting more thorough and a process that can, you know, autopilot's the wrong word for it, but they can run and everybody understands how it runs. Um, and, and we have great leadership now, but in the future when there's a different change in leadership that this thing can continue. Um, I will say that I, in adding to the conversation, I would, I would encourage you not to move away from succeed. Um, it's a universal term. And so I think the more you obfuscate a term like succeed, I think the harder it is to accomplish what that is. Um, and then, so I would suggest that. And, I'm, and I think that I've learned from the superintendent that we don't have to call not succeeding what we usually call it. <laughs> uh, and I'm cool with that. Uh, but I, I think it's important to not obfuscate what that is. They're gonna get more resources. Uh, they're gonna get less you know, support because they don't need those things. And so we should go on what it is and so that everyone is trying to get into that space. And it's clear to parents and everybody else because in, the, in every, other, every other place you're going to run into, people are calling it success. Um, and so I would encourage you to stay with that, with that, that term. Um, although, you know, Pat comes up with a good alternative. I, I really do think we're, we are starting for success, so I think it's important to say that. Uh, and this process does breed that, and I think that that's the coolest part of it. Uh, so I'm excited about it. All right, Dan, we'll duel this out, you and I. <laughs> it's clear. Everybody knows what it is. Succeed is succeed. No questions about it. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, I, I did have a lot more questions, but uh, Pat already put me on blast for, uh, <laughs> for uh, you know, talking too much. So, no, I mean, I guess my only um, question, because like I said, I mean, I've had a chance to see this, you know, for the last several months and, and, and the details of it. Um, you know, we will have to come back 
to this as a board in the early fall because I think we're going to have to make some decisions about, you know, what we want to implement going into next year. I mean, there's all this work that's been done, uh, as we've said, with CPRO, but with our staff, our teachers, our principals, to get it to a place where, again, we, we've seen today. Uh, and so I, I guess I would just sort of foreshadow for the board, like, we're going to come back to this, um, you know, August, September, just to like talk through it and, you know, uh, just make some decisions around, uh, again, what we want to implement for the next school year, recognizing that uh, it may not be the full model right away, which is fine because we have to, I think, phase into this, uh, but we will be coming back to this for some decision points. So I know we have the information that was presented today in our, um, in our folder for this meeting. And, um, you know, I would just, you know, encourage you all to, to take a look at it. If questions emerge, uh, you know, I'd say let's shoot them to the superintendent. Is that right? And then you can help us, you know, um, because we will likely spend uh, a significant chunk of time talking about this again uh, in August and maybe September, just again, because we want to be able to make some decisions around what we start implementing uh, heading into the new school year. So. Uh, just foreshadowing that. All right, any other uh, superintendent, Elizabeth, the team, any other questions, thoughts related to, to this? And again, I appreciate uh, uh, just walking us through what's been months, actually years uh, of work uh, to get us to this point. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for paying attention and giving us support and thank Cynthia in particular for making our folks available um, at a time of, again, I just, I, I'm, I'm quite mindful of the challenge that everybody has been under, um, but I'm looking forward to getting some more time, at least with central staff, um, when summer comes along and, um, and we can really work through some of this. Um, but thank you. Great, and maybe Elizabeth, you alluded to this, but either through you or the superintendent, can you talk about what, what is gonna be happening over the next, you know, couple of months? Um, there's some great questions you asked, but so we, we have the answer them. So, so what's good, what's the work look like? Um, should I start, Cynthia? Um, we will be reaching out to principals um, as we speak, basically, um, to try to get some of their time, particularly those who have volunteered in response to our surveys, that they're interested in continuing to work both on the autonomies and the target setting, um, because we want to. Um, sit down with them and work through it when they're not in one of these crunched meetings um, and get them to articulate on the autonomies exactly where some of the overlap feels right, where it feels wrong, and then also the supports um, need better articulation. Uh, we also, and, um, and then for the principals, I think we want to use some of them to kind of pressure test the framework, like sit down with them uh, unfortunately, virtually, and actually populate the framework with some of their own school data to see what it looks like when you try to do that and then use that to set targets. Um, again, not to hold anybody accountable, but really just to see if it works. And um, because I don't think that's been done. Um, and then we want to do um, work with central staff over the course of the summer, either one on one or in small groups in order to, again, clarify and refine with the people who really understand um, how things work at Lawrence and what also will kind of advance some of these goals without being burdensome. I mean, I think if, if, you, if we make it burdensome, it won't work no matter how shiny it is. So um, the goal is to make, to kind of streamline it and make sure that it aligns with what else is happening in the district. And I'll just add, Elizabeth, that you can expect that we will come back to you all uh, as early as September again for uh, additional information and possibly uh, a vote. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, well, thanks for all your work. Um, and again, just appreciate the presentation tonight um, as well. Great, thank you. And uh, it was a joy to sit in on uh, very particularly the first part of the meeting today with the, um, with the families. That was lovely. Um, great, um, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Elizabeth, thanks, Chris. Great, thank you. Bye-bye. Superintendent, I think that concludes your report, correct? And so I see you haven't gotten the text to join the city council meeting yet. All right, so Bye. we're gonna keep going. We're almost done, great. Um, okay, uh, great. So um, I'm gonna come back to the item that I had on the, um, 
the report of the chair. So um, in reviewing, and I give credit to our attorney, in reviewing um, sort of different documents just related to, um, you know, our, our appointment. So we have our individual appointment letters to the LAE, which are five-year terms that the commissioner had, you know, appointed us. We also have an MOU uh, between the LAE and the department, which, you know, we signed also when we started. What we found though, um, and I didn't quite catch this previously, is that the MOU was actually for three years, not the five years that, you know, we had, um, uh, our terms are. And so, um, you know, it was gonna expire basically at the end of this month. So what I've done is, uh, put back the MOU. It's the exact same language of the current MOU that we have, uh, but you know it's now a, a second one that starts another three-year term, just because that was the terms of of the first one. And you know, if you scan it again, this is something that we uh, created together and voted on. It, it lays out primarily the the roles and responsibilities um, that you know we have as an LAE, uh, and then I'd say in concert with you know, this document and the superintendent's contract where we then delegate some things to the superintendent, that sort of lays out what our roles and responsibilities are. And so, because this is expiring, um, oh, I need to bring it back and I need a motion uh, and a vote for us to approve, basically extending this or creating a new MOU, which is the same as the last one, but we just need to cover the term starting July 1st. Uh, of this year. I'd like to make a motion to extend the current COP, um, the MOU as stated without, as long as there isn't any substantive significant changes for another three years. Is that okay? That's fine for me. I was just saying there's a second. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm pausing. No, and I, and I, yeah, just a quick discussion on that. Yeah, sorry. I'll, so I just I'll, Dan put I'll it. second it so, so we can have some discussion. Great. Okay, great. So floor is now open for discussion. Uh, Dan, yeah. go ahead. We're going up the alphabet now. Yeah, so I just want to make sure that, you know, I use the words no substantive uh, significant changes so that, you know, if somebody points out, hey, there is a substantive significant change <laughs> that it invalidates the extension. I just don't want to change. I, I'm all for, um, you know, replicating what we already have. Um, for another three years, um, you know, so that doesn't, you know, um, so that the agreement doesn't go um, expire. I'm, I'm totally for that. And I think that the way we've been working is we're fine. But what I just don't want to do is wake up one day and find that the, the contract is different. Yeah. And, and I can speak to that. I mean, happy to, um, you know, we sent it out ahead of time. Happy to do a side, by side by side. Person. The only thing that is different are the dates. Uh, we literally kept... Mm -hmm. The same language it's just we changed the dates um you know to a to a line to a term starting july 1st okay. 2021 yeah my motion stands okay uh pat are we voting no no, no. any no. any i'm sorry no, i was going no, to let the order up no, if there are any comments discussion actually we can just open it up if if yeah no i'm okay with it okay All right, so any other questions or? Yeah, I, I guess I would like it. I don't want, I don't want to vote on it tonight. Like I, I, I know we need to renew it, but I would like a chance to look at it because one of the things that I feel like it does if we renew it for another three years is it kind of sidesteps this question of what's our process for working with the local school committee what's our process for returning eventually to local control and i the the current mou to my recollection and i haven't given it a thorough read le recently doesn't say anything about that process and i know we have a like a parallel or separate conversation going around you know some joint meetings with the school committee and and some training for folks um to help facilitate the eventual return, but I feel like that's a pretty big kind of structural question that the current MOU doesn't address. So I'm not actually super in favor of, of approving the, the MOU that we currently have. I'd, I'd like a chance to look at it and see if there's any, you know, suggestions or changes that we want to make in terms of like the 
our relationship with Desi and how that relates specifically also to the school committee locally. Yeah, um, and to be clear, like we did send this out ahead of time, just I mean, and so folks could, you know, could look at it and, and come up with questions. I mean, I guess the way I feel um, about it is, first of all, if this expires, like this is how we are appointed as a board or as a body uh, to serve as a receiver. So without this, uh, you know, I don't know how we can operate uh, legally. Um, and so I, I would urge us to adopt it for that reason. However, I just want to say, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, just like I think the points that you've raised in terms of, you know, what does uh, working with the school committee look like? What does, you know, sort of the future of receivership, which really aren't, I mean, the, the, that last question aren't necessarily in the sort of scope of what we as the receiver do. I mean, that really is on the commissioner. Uh, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, though. I think like, you know, uh, approving this tonight so we can continue legally to be the receiver and still, you know, sort of asking for clarity around uh, just this ongoing relationship with the school committee or, you know, sort of the other uh, items that you said, I think are still important and we need to do. And so I don't necessarily think that we need to do them in this document because, again, this is more sort of laying out the basic roles and responsibilities and just legally authorizes us to be the receiver. And so I would, you know, sort of ask that we approve this so we can continue to be the receiver through the end of June. But does it mean that the issues you brought up, like we shouldn't continue discussing and trying to get clarity on? Mr. Chair? Can I, yep. can I just follow I have a suggestion. Up? Dan, can I just follow that up? With, I just have a couple of other comments too. I mean, I do feel like there are things in this MOU, like for instance, uh, you know, we're supposed to have seven members that's outlined in the MOU. We've only had six for, you know, up just about a year now. We're supposed to be evaluated annually by the commissioner. I'm not sure that that has ever happened in my recollection. I mean, maybe, you know, we can we can approve the MOU and then discuss, you know, whether things are happening to as as they should under it. But I I do, yeah, I feel like there's some open questions. That's all. Yep. If, if again, if I could just to those two points, we again, this isn't changing. We we still need to have a seventh member, and the commissioner appoints all of us. So he appointed all of us. And so again, if the question is getting clarity around where's the seventh member. Like, you know, I think that that that, that definitely can happen. Um, and then just to the point of uh, the evaluation, we actually do get copies and have gotten copies every year uh, of those evaluations. Um, so I'm happy to confirm, uh, and I know Joan, this will be your last meeting, but I'm happy to go back through, or maybe ask Joan to go through the minutes because I'm, I'm you know, I'm pretty confident that we've, as LAE received them, but, Joan, if you can help me confirm that, that would be, that would be helpful. That would be helpful because I don't remember us ever discussing that or having that be part of the packets. But I mean, I could have. Yeah, let's it. go through. I appreciate that because I've, I've I've seen them. I mean, like you know. So I just want to make sure that we can point to, um, you know. Those they well. ask a question. <clears throat> yep. So were they actually? Um, separate documents or one big document staying you know showing about the evaluation of the receivership one document is that what it was it's what yearly evaluations of the receiver okay ventura if i i have a suggestion I right. can i, Dan can was I get to say the... something pat sorry Dan was going to say something i'll come to you pat um listen i I got to tell you, I, I, above all folks in these conversations, have been the most frustrated with that relationship question. And I got to tell you, I've not, I, I've been super frustrated. And it's, it's to the point that it's emotional. And I just, I'm trying not to say the things that are in my head right now. Um, because it's frustrating um, that we don't have a path. But I got to tell you, it's of our, a lot of it, a lot of it is of our own making. And so I'm, I'm, I'm super frustrated with that. Um, and, and I got to tell you, it, you know, the, the folks that have used this path or questioned about that path as a way to just be against the district, I don't appreciate that. Because there's real good work going, hard work that's going on it. And so 
the, the conversation is is not forward, not because of a lack of venues. I think it's a lack of, of, you know, true. Everybody wants the independence. Everybody wants local control. I want it too. But, you know, I, I think the reasons why folks want it are just widely, widely off base a lot of times. That being said, I agree, just this is a big question, and it will have send a big um, it will send a big message. To that end, Mr. Chair, if you would uh, entertain the motion to be to extend it for uh, a year, and then if a path is not discussed and come up to, then it automatically gets uh, automatically gets renewed for two more years. You see what I'm saying? Now it motivates everybody to talk for a year, and then if at the end of the year, you're right, it would mean that the you know the, the Commissioner could be totally unmotivated to do it and just sit out the year and it gets renewed. Yeah. But doesn't that motivate us to come to some agreement? And so I, I, I don't disagree with Jess that this is a big deal. It will send out my message. I frankly think it's a good message to send to they say, hey, we're nowhere. And so three years more is exactly what's going to happen. I don't know if that's what you wanted to do. So I, I think a good way to say it is let's extend it for a year. Uh, and then if a, and if a direction hasn't, it automatically goes for two more years. That gets us over the July 1st thing, and it gets us to the point where people all have to talk about this thing. It, it I, is incredibly frustrating. So, Dan, I guess I like 50% agree with you. I mean, I, cert I definitely agree with the frustration part of it. I also agree that, you know, this is not, uh, of course, there's, you know, not, I don't even want to use the word blame, but there's reasons on all sides, right, from the, from the, commissioner to us to the school committee you know why why things might not have got gone down ideally or smoothly but i i do feel i i and so i i'm definitely down with a one year um extension or renewal but i'd like a different kind of condition on it because to me that puts all of the power in the commissioner's hands and you know and if he and I'm not, I don't, I can't read his mind and I don't know, you know, where he's sitting on this, but I think we, we do, let's think about what, what is the right carrot and stick for us to move on this locally to get something nailed down around this, um, you know, that either that we can present with him, but then that we have some guarantee, you know, that he, that he will engage with us on um, and have a conversation about. Yeah. And that's why I'd like to see it as a provision of the MOU, maybe. Hey, Jess, I am like, I, I love being the agent of my own change. I love it. And I, I, and I preach it. That's not, that's, not the, that's not the reality we live right now. And that the commissioner could actually just let this go and then make all the decisions. And so the question is, how do we get through July 1st? And it is, we should be motivated. Us, more than anybody else, should be motivated to figure out how to get this thing done. It's, it's just not how it works out. Again, I'm trying not to say all the stuff that's in my head. Just all I'm saying is, let's get through July. I'll I'll work with you. I'll go. I don't. You know. Again, I'm not the mayor anymore, and so I. But I'll be willing to go and help figure this thing out for a year. But if a year we don't get our stuff together, then I think we should have the uncertainty of the receivership would cause problems in running the district. That's a guarantee. Just like this, this year, um, a mayor's race is causing uh, uncertainty in City Hall. So things stop. It, it was the, it's, it's, it's crazy to me how it actually does stop the bureaucracy. And so any you know, um, ambiguity about what's happening with the receivership would cause that. Again, that's why I think that the trigger should be on us to try to figure out a, a path in a year. Um, Pat, no, I mean, just curious if you have if you have thoughts. So the only thing I was going to add for Jess is that we usually get our evaluation the end of June, the first week of July, and it usually comes uh, by email. No more, Jess. I don't remember seeing it. To all of us, or to each of us individually, it comes to us as a group. Mm -hmm. I'm with Jess. I don't remember seeing him. That doesn't mean they don't exist. I just don't. Yeah, but we've never discussed it at a board meeting that I can remember. No, because we're usually on summer break, and I think by the time we get back, it's almost like ancient history. 
you know, we're more focused on the kids coming back to school. What has he said about us? We're we, awesome. we could... <laughs> 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 Noemi, any, uh, any, any thoughts or, or comments? Yeah, the only thing that I was going to say is like, while, you know, I agree with Jess, and this is something that has to be resolved, I think that we should also treat it separately from the contract. I think that there are two different issues. One of them is the contract, uh, contract as it pertains to us being the board. But we also need to have a serious discussion on the side, and I guess along the side, as you said, that will include Jeff, you know, the, the commissioner, and really present to him our concerns and maybe we are the one who work with him to figure out what would be the pathway and include the school committee. But I, I, I don't feel that the contract will be the place to have that discussion because the contract is about, about Cynthia's performance. It's not about uh, who, has the, who, is, who is leading the school district in terms of being a school committee or is us. Um, so, but that conversation needs to happen and, and I agree with both so I agree with both, with Dan on one side and also with Jess, and we need to figure out, but I think it has to be separate um, in order for us to be effective. Ventura? Yep. Um, being part of the school committee, um, the past few meetings, the discussion has happened as far as joint meetings, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, there's been some letters sent to the commissioner and some response saying that there would be some training in the coming year for the school mm -hmm. board, the school committee. Um, and I think that's what we're, we're working our way into the joint meetings. That would be good. And, and I, I don't see combining the two with this issue mm -hmm. is going to help it. I think, I think we're, we're moving, it may be baby steps, but we're moving towards that joint meeting. Yeah, and, and I guess if, if I could just say, um, and again, like as I said earlier, like, no, I mean, I don't want to restate what you said, but I completely agree uh, with, uh, with both issues. I mean, this, this is an MOU. For me, this sets the legal just uh, ability for us to continue to serve as receiver, and that's sort of how I view this. I think the issues that have been raised, and not just tonight, but I mean, like, in general of, like, you know, wanting some clarity around, again, how we – interact with the school committee and you're right, Pat, there is now that the school year is ending, like the ability to extend training um, to the school committee and, and, you know, working our way towards sounds like some, some joint meetings, but I think that work has to continue. And if there's any other clarity, uh, you know, we're appointed by the commissioner to our role. So, you know, if we see clarity uh, from him around any matters, I think that makes sense. But I, I like knowing me, I see those as, you know, both important, but just separate in terms of right now, this just setting our legal uh, sort of framework for serving as receiver. So uh, but obviously I'll hear uh, if there are more, Dan, when you said I found it, what was that? I just saw it in the chat. We we are streaming. streaming or the I was wondering whether or not we were streaming. Okay, okay, yeah. okay got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, how, so I guess, I, I do appreciate the dis I, the distinction that that you guys are making, and yet I I continue to feel like these are related matters, right? Like the MOU defines the terms of our the LAE's receivership of the school system, and so it's sort of implicit in that is the question of you know how long this arrangement is going to continue and you know, by by signing that MOU, I feel like we're implicitly saying this is definitely going to get, receivership is definitely going to continue for at least another three years, right? I don't want to see receivership continue for another three years without some kind of documented commitment on the part of DESE to working to integrate the work of the receivership board and the elected school committee and committing to, you know, some return to some form of local control around this. And believe me, I, I, I want to say also for the, like, I'm not, 
I'm not like just romanticizing local control, right? Like if, when we can get back to local control, we also have a responsibility as a, com as a community to make sure that we're encouraging and electing like awesome leaders for, for the school committee, right? But I, I do feel like there, <laughs> we can vote on this, right? I'll probably abstain, but um, if we vote on it, I, I just think we also, we've had a lot of starts and stops on the, on sort of on the margins towards trying to make this more joint approach work. And I just want to say for the record that, I mean, I, I would vote on it more concretely with Dan's like amendment to it, if that's going to be something that like lights the fire under this to get this resolved one way or another this year and kind of create create more of a path. Jess, could I, Venture, could I add something? I have the MOU in front of me and item number 10 speaks about termination and that the commissioner may dismiss the LAE as receiver by terminating this MOU. So it, it really, if, if within the context of the three years, if we are ready to transfer control back to the, to the um, school committee, this, this can be terminated at any time by the commissioner. So that doesn't preclude us not working together to get joint meetings and to gradually bring the school committee on. Say this three, I'm taking it to mean that the document is for three years, but it can be terminated at any time. Yeah, that's correct. I, I, yeah, that, that's correct. Can I, I just wanna, cause I, I did make the second motion because I agree with just, I don't see them as two separate things. I see them as the same thing. I just think, you know, yes, we've <laughs> <laughs> we've been uh, we've been in receivership for a long time. This is not just three years we've been in receivership, and you know, I'm just shocked at the you know the way things continue to go. So I see them as the same thing, and I think I think voting tonight, and I'm not sure that Ventura wanted to do that. That's why the the out is let's do it for a year, and if you know at the end of the year the sides are so far apart that it just automatically gets done for another two years. Um, but I just, you know, the other message, we can't even, you know, um, you know, renew a, an MOU even for at least for 12 months is a bad message too. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm willing to renew it. I, I'd be willing to renew it for a 12 month period. Um, you know, I do agree with you that they're not separate issues and I don't, I, I don't actually think that the. LAE and the school committee are that far apart. I mean, first of all, they're overlapping, right? Because we have Pat, Dan, are you still on the school committee? No, No. the chair is the mayor. The chair is the mayor, okay, well, yeah. he's Pat, but you know, that's just sort of another consideration or something to think about, right? Because when this was originally constituted, there was a deliberate effort to, to include two members of the school, at least two members of the school committee in this. And so now if we're, we're in this situation and we have an empty slot, we ought to think about that. But we, we don't get to think about that. Jeff has to think about that, right? And, you know, I, I, I also tend to think, and, you know, I, how can I, I'm trying to search for a way to phrase this diplomatically, but, I, you know, the way the MOU is written, I think, and the relationship that it describes sometimes contributes to some murkiness over what the LAE board actually has control and say over, you know, versus what is going to, you know, for lack of a better way to phrase this, come down from Desi that, you know, <coughs> we and the school district basically have to comply with. And so, you know, I'm fine to renew it for, I, I just, I wish that, I realize that it went out in the packet, you know, without, um, 
because maybe it was being it was going to be seen as like something that we we would just automatically renew but i i think it is actually something that we need to have this level of discussion at as a board um as, can i just say this one thing you know have you ever seen the board chair of lae have to write the letter that he wrote to the city have to what write the letter that he wrote to the city you know what i'm talking about with the one about payment or the one yeah, yeah. why would just pick anybody <laughs> why would not just why would jeff pick anybody from the school board to to be on this board if the most simplest of tasks are being overlooked it's again I, I got so much but that's not the school committee that's the city right no it's not okay. and so, again I, I just i did that's the this is about the extension so again unless the chair meant to make a signal about three years which i'm prepared to vote for or not I, i'm prepared to vote i think the out is to do the year with the trigger on th on three um, in the end, the, the, again, the receiver can do as, I mean, the, the commissioner could say, yeah, I'm going to just, the MOU is good for three years. And by, by, by not meeting with us, he, it'll just trigger a three-year deal. But I, mean, I think I get you over the hump, at least for now. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate this discussion. And again, I guess you're right. In my mind, it, this is more of a sort of technical, sort of just legal authority for us to serve as receiver. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, again, like, appreciate the discussion. I still just personally feel like this sets our legal uh, just sort of frame to, to serve as receiver, but I completely appreciate the concern, you know, just the questions, like the concerns, and I don't want to uh, stifle those, and I don't want to like appear as I'm trying to like ram this thing down, you know what I mean? Like I really genuinely just, you know, um, appreciate this discussion because it is, you know, uh, I, I hear the points. I, I think where we're at, though, and just, um, you know, one is um, there's a motion on the table, or, yeah, there's a motion and it's been seconded, and we're discussing it, um, to, so we could vote on that, which is the motion is, you know, the three-year, uh, as it currently stands, which is no substantive changes other than the dates, you know, of the document. Um, you know, I, I think with the other models like even if it's like a one year and then we there's a trigger like I, I just I don't feel comfortable with the details of understanding that right now to be able to like I'd actually like to talk to our lawyer you know what I mean like if that we're going to be an approach um you know as well um so you know I guess alternatively we you know we could approve a one year and then have to then give ourselves a year to figure out you know the details and, and whatever happens there I think that's sort of how I'm seeing it. So Dan, I think to your point, like it would be a year, but I guess I'm not really comfortable putting in like triggers and this like, unless we have time to like talk through those a little bit more. Um, I don't know. It's just sort of my perspective um, on it right now. Um, so uh, again, have, have Chair, if you want, I can, I would, I can withdraw my, my, both my motions and, uh, and give you a motion for a year. Uh, I'm, re I'm ready to vote for three. Just so I'm just, I'm pretty clear about it. And so if you want to press forward on three and see if we got the votes, let's do that. But I'm, you know, I'll, I'll do a one if you want me to. I, I would prefer a one, you know, but I, I'm one person and this is a democracy more or less. So, so you can move the motion or you well, can I, ask me to I withdraw. Just, I just feel like, let me do this thing because it seems to be people are in different places. There's a motion on the table that's been seconded. Let's vote that. If it doesn't pass, then I can entertain a second motion or a, a different motion. Um, so... Pat, it looks like you were going to say something. If not, I'll go to the to the vote. Well, you mentioned something about talking to legal counsel. Um, we still have a few weeks left till the end of June, and I'm not one for looking for more meetings. But would you want to take the time to speak to legal counsel and then get us back together again? To yeah, to be clear, that was only like again what I was hearing from triggers. Dan of like a trigger and this and that. Like I don't need to. Uh, n no, if we're going to, you know, if we approve it, I don't need to speak to legal counsel further. It was just sort of that other, you know, what in my mind sounded like a complicated, you know, I, I didn't know how to like structure right, something like that. Yeah. I, I guess I will also, so I don't, if I'm, if I'm procedurally allowed to do so, I would withdraw my second of that. Like I seconded Dan's motion yeah. for discussion, but I I'm going to withdraw my second if it's just to approve it as That makes is. sense. 
Yep. Okay. Um, duly noted. So, all right. So let me um, work it through a few different ways just to kind of try to see where we're at. So, um, well, if my motion doesn't get a second, it just dies. What I was going to say is, so there's still a motion on the table to approve the, um, the MOU as is. Is there a second for that? I'll second it for a vote. Okay. Any further discussion? I thought we'll take a vote on that and see where, where that lands. All right, um, so the motion is to approve the revised um, MOU um, as, as, as presented. So, Jess? No. No, I mean? You're on mute, sweetie. You're on mute, Nomi. No. Okay, Pat? Yes. Dan? Yes. Uh, and the chair votes, yes. So we have three to two, uh, so the motion carries. Um, doesn't feel good. Um, sure. You know, the motion carries, mm -hmm. leave it there. Um, but, but I guess what I would say is, um, again, as I've said, tonight, like, I don't view these things as mutually exclusive. Uh, I, I think we need to work on, you know, the yes to MOU, but sort of the questions that we as an LAE have. Uh, and I think, you know, want to pose or need clarity from the commissioner uh, on. And so I, I really want to say that publicly that again, in my mind, this is about a legal sort of technical, important thing for to allow us to continue doing our jobs as receiver. But I am not saying that the issues that have been raised are not critically important and that, you know, we need to dedicate some time to as a board. Uh, and I'm happy to take a lead on this on either, you know, having additional meetings or reaching out to members to make sure we're, we're capturing what those questions are and, and concerns, uh, because I think that is absolutely appropriate, um, you know, for us as a, as a board. So. Ventura, could we, could I make a motion that um, let, let me see how I want to phrase it. That we begin discussions with the commissioner um, as to when and what the conditions would be for the district to return to local control or a timeline, something to that effect. Would that help the situation? I mean, I, I leave that to the board. I mean, I, I guess I personally don't feel like we need a motion to do that. I would say let's, I'm happy to reach out and we can, you know, even send a letter, you know, uh, asking some of those questions and requesting information. But, you know, um, you know, and, 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 and again, like, I don't know, I'd have to talk to legal counsel, obviously, around, um, me, you know, just meetings and what we can discuss public versus executive session. But I just think it's fair for us to capture what our questions are and our concerns or, you know, again, questions and communicate those to, uh, to the commissioner. Like if, if we, if we really have those, then I think we should do that. So what, what's the forum for doing that? Is that it, do we do that in open meeting as a, is that an agenda item or do we do that in exact? I don't, is that, it that's what I'm saying. I don't know. I need to talk okay. to legal counsel okay. uh, to see what is allowed because under the law, there's only so you know, specific reasons we can go into executive session. Uh, yeah. So I need to confirm with uh, uh, Attorney Cook, who who works with us. So I will um, I can commit to doing that, and then coming back to the board and seeing what are our options for discussing this, and then we can discuss whatever actions we may want to take. You know, after that, so I can I can talk to the attorney and get back to you all. You know, by latest early next week, with what she says. Okay. Small like practical logistical point, which is that I'm not going to be able to be at the next board meeting. Um, and so I would prefer to be at that discussion if we have it in open meeting. And so uh, just requesting that. Yeah, um, I, I, think I that, would feel strongly that we should all be there so we can work around schedules. Mr. Chair, can I just say something? I think um, I'm trying to figure out a way to say this without coming across as crass. I think that we have a valuable um, example on how we can build this path um, that everyone would like to get on. And we just have to do it. Yeah. We have to begin to show, we don't, we, no, the difference is, I don't want to ask for it. 
we just have to start acting like the most important thing that we do on the school committee or as members of the community is to teach our kids. And that's not what we do. You know, no one showed us how to get out of oversight from the state, from our financial things. They just knew when they saw it, that we were ready. And I'm just telling you that every day we have every opportunity to get back on that path, supporting the La Voz, supporting the superintendent. That means not fighting with the superintendent. That's not mean it doesn't challenge her. We challenge her all the time. That means, you know, there, there are ways to do it without getting permission or even, when you're talking about the rules, you're already losing. Just start doing it. And I, I just, it, it's where the frustration comes from. No one's going to give us a path to get our schools back. We start have to just focusing on the things that are positive. And if you think that the path to get our schools back is totally, you know, beginning a conversation of changing the American public school system, that is not the path. The path is let's support, let's get behind folks, let's challenge people. Like what they did with the Oliver School. The school, the city council was about to vote not to put, and we came together. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, uh, you know, a, a vote of no confidence on the superintendent because she's doing what every other superintendent in the Commonwealth is doing around COVID-19 just shows that, you know, we're not ready. Dan, I want to echo what you are saying because, you know, I have met with some uh, members of the school committee. And one of the things that I have mentioned is that while we don't have joint meetings, they could at least show up to some of these meetings, come in and share during the public uh, hearing, peace, sign your name, bring your voice, and being present. Um, these are ways in which they can show their support and show their interest and, and you know, participation as part of the discussion that we're having. Because um, you're right, you know, we can ask the commissioner, we want this to happen tomorrow, and if they don't feel that we're ready, they're not going to do it. They're just going to do it. They're not going to do it no matter how much we ask. So it has, we have to prove it by action. And I think, um, you know, those are steps that will should be taken. So I will, um, I'm sorry, just go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I, I do mostly agree with that. I just think it's not, it's also, it's not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not inappropriate for us as a body to ask the commissioner, you know, to be clear about the conditions under which he sees us returning that way. Because, you know, this whole thing may be like pornography and that you know it when you see it, right? But it's, it's not, that's not the same for everyone. And it's like, that was a quote, by the way, of a famous judge. Yeah. That wasn't just me <laughs> making an off-color remark. I want yeah. to say that for the record. Just as black, right? Um, yeah, I saw people's faces. So I was like, let me clarify. Um, so, but I, I do feel like, um, you know, it, it, it is appropriate for us to ask for some written clarity or guidance, um, you know, that, that lays out some, at least some general parameters around this. I don't disagree, you're right. So I will um, take it on just responsibility to reach out to our attorney. I'll do that tomorrow morning and just kind of get better understanding of uh, sort of the um, venues in which we can have discussions, you know, uh, just, you know, sort of of this nature and then get back to the group. And if we, could, if we need to schedule a separate time, you know, that's not already scheduled, happy to do that uh, in terms of what's the content and sort of just next steps, you know, that we want to take with any questions that we may have as a board um, around, again, the, the questions raised tonight. And Joan, I know we have them in the minutes and we have the video so I can go back if we need to capture like some of those questions to, to put back in front of the board. So, all right, thank you all. Um, I am gonna move us on. The last items are approval of the minutes, the regular session on March 17th and then the executive regular sessions on, in April and, and May. So uh, do I have a motion to approve the March 17th minutes? And Ventura, can I, I can I actually just make one announcement when you're done with that? If that's yeah, okay. absolutely, it's relevant, it's relevant. But yes, sorry. To the yeah, okay. So do I have a motion to approve the March 17 minutes? Yes, um, move. I'll second Pat's motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, roll call, Jess. Yes. Noemi. Yes. Pat. Yes. Dan. Yes. And the chair votes yes, so those are approved. Um, do I have a motion to approve the April 14th executive and regular session minutes? So moved. Second. All right, uh, Jess. Yes. Noemi. Yes. Pat. Yes. Dan. Yes. And the chair votes yes. And do I have a motion to approve the May 12th, 2021 executive and re regular session minutes? So move. Second. All right. Uh, Jess? Yes. Noemi? Yes. Pat? Yes. Dan? Yeah. And the chair votes yes, so so those are approved. So we're at the end of the agenda. Uh, Jess, you had an announcement? Yep, so I just wanted to say, and I hope people are still listening to this, um, if there are LPS parents who are experiencing um, difficulty paying rent, um, I know that we've sent a lot of information out about this um, through the schools in various ways, but especially if it's a COVID-related hardship, um, there are funds available um, through LCW, through GLCAC, um, and, and uh, others that we're working in partnership with. It doesn't matter if you're documented or undocumented. There's different pots of money that can help different people. So please, if you know of anyone who's having this difficulty, um, and at risk of housing instability or eviction or anything like that, please, please, please get in touch um, with us uh, as we do have funds available for that. And then the last thing I just wanted to say was this is Joan's last meeting, right? So thank yeah. you so much, Joan. Thank you, Joan. The quiet, amazing, consistent, high quality support that you've provided to us over these years. We really, really appreciate it. And, and we wish you much. Us. Yes. And no, thank you for that. And Jess, we did get a chance to uh, acknowledge uh, Joan at the beginning as well, but I think it's only appropriate that we close as well with that because uh, uh, again, just uh, literally from the beginning, <laughs> you know, Joan has been with us uh, helping uh, support all our work. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. If you need me, you know where I am. I can still yeah. answer questions. <laughs> all right, I, at this, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn at this point. So moved. Second. Okay. All right, uh, no discussion. All right, Jess? <laughs> yes. Noemi? Yes. Pat? Yes. Dan? Yes. Uh, and the chair votes yes. So we are now adjourned. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, again, I'll be in contact with the board um, and the public around the next meeting. Thank you.